All right, man. I was just eating a, an orange, and the fucking thing had so many goddamn seeds in it. Like there was more seed than actual fruit. Very disappointing. Not a very auspicious start to the day. But you know what they say about the whole idea of an ideal start? They say that an ideal start is not not really ideal, right? It's very deceptive. Because if you think that everything is, is right, you get a little bit complacent. And when you first encounter some sort of obstacle, you're like, how, how could this happen? You're resentful towards it. But if you come into something a little bit at a disadvantage, then you're already geared into expecting an obstacle. And that usually leads you to success. It happens in the gym sometimes, you know? Like, you have, you're feeling really good, you're having a great day, your legs feel nice and strong, you get under the bar, want to squat your warm-up, and suddenly it just feels so fucking heavy. But then, days that you're sick, and you're like, I just gotta grind through, you just grind through. You're ready. So, <laughs> thank you, Orange. Thank you for jading me against the world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another stream with your boy, Indian Abroad, aka James. We are going to be doing a final master study of uh, John Riva. Because just want to test out theories. Uh, I did a bunch of research on his work uh, whenever I got a moment yesterday. Just want to finalize some ideas. Hopefully, I'm coming through all right. I had to mess with a bunch of settings on the audio. I'm gonna switch over in just a second. Here we go. There you go. Fancy transition. Excellent. All right. Dead Desire, how's it going? Good to see you. And Polly, the early birds in here. We've got some new music in the uh, in the stream as well. So we have, excuse me, <laughs> a bit of an acid reflux there. We have officially moved to using Streamlabs OBS. So that's the first time that's ever happened. And hopefully it's gonna help a little bit because OBS, the, the real hog for the RAM is Chrome. But I'm just gonna test out how Streamlabs OBS does. Like, will I, will I be able to get, um, you know, slightly better performance, I guess, with the, with everything, because it does matter to me a little bit about the comfort. Like I said before, you'll seldom hear me bitch about it continuously, saying that, oh my goodness, you know, if my computer wasn't lagging, you guys would see so much better art. It, it doesn't make for a good streaming or watching experience. We just, we make do with what we have. However, I'm not blind to the idea that, you know, things could indeed get better. So uh, this is the first foray into that. We're going to be studying this little one. I use slobs and keep Chrome closed when I stream. The integrated chat is about all I need. How do you play music, Polly, on your stream? Because I use Chrome for music. Also, please let me know uh, if there's any obscuring happening. I'm gonna have to rely on you guys. I did as many tests as I could, but my methods are not exhaustive. So I'm gonna need you to tell me if, at whatever point, if something is covering something else, because I have to do a lot of rearranging on my screen. I don't know if everything is totally reliable. Um, excuse me, why are you transparent? Oh, it's because the eraser's act. That's new, I never knew that. The fill tool seems to draw the pixel from your current selected brush. I had an eraser selected and the fill tool just erased everything. Okay, well, I never had, had, had that happen to me. Alright, you learn something every day. Couple hours of classic, uh, classical music that plays through VLC. Really? Okay, I might have to do that myself. Because it really sucks for me if the world is unmuted. Okay, so we have a couple of crits to go through before we begin painting today. If anybody has anything that you want to throw my way, uh, that'll be good too. So let's just get through it. What do we have first? Uh, so Solmir. Solmir is following one of the courses that I have personally recommended on the stream a bunch of times, which is the John Hunter's course on Essentials of Realism. Essentials of Realism, let's remember to enunciate. It's just the beginning of the stream, we don't have an excuse. So the painting is this, I'm sure you guys will enjoy it, it's really good. His work is on the left, the reference is on the right. And the accompanying comment is this, I'll read it out for you. Uh, um, this is done according to the John Hardesty assignment, requiring to lower down values of a reference and work on the fire value system. The thing I'm thinking now, that I'm looking at it, is maybe I should push the lights and keep my docs very compressed like this, and get a more contrastive picture. What do you think? Okay, so this particular assignment is done with the idea that you want to lower the key. So when we talk about keying and artwork, 
It is essentially the idea that you don't necessarily have to always pick something as your darks and something as your lights. There's actually a lot more to it than that, especially when you get to a more intermediate level. And the reason it's recommended to try and paint in different keys is because it really puts the pressure on the artist to think about the principle of what they're doing as opposed to one is to one reference. Because you can just, you know, you can ultimately end up with the correct result um, if you just use the best reference, but you don't you might necessarily understand why it works the way it does. So it's, it's just a test uh, of principle. And the principle being is that it doesn't really matter what the value is in its, uh, in its you know, in itself, but it, what it matters is, is its difference with the values that are next to it. So this is teaching us the relativeness of values. So you, you can paint something in a higher key or a lower key, but ultimately it shouldn't have a crazy impact on your read. So just because you, know, you don't choose this value over here as your darkness and this value over here as your light, it shouldn't mean that you sacrifice the clarity of your image. So it all depends on just exactly how you filter through your reference, how you understand how to transfer value. And it should be uh, it should be fairly easy. The fundamental thing in this particular case to understand: uh, Do I have a do I have something for crits? Hold on. Do I have a text for crits? What is this text? Say? Oh, that's not okay. Let me change that. Cool. Okay. So the fundamental idea to remember over here is that when you have value, for example, if I say, let's just talk about just a singular, you know, contrast of piece of value. So it's a couple of different, you know, years of value. So let's say, let's say this is my half then right here, right? The half then in the picture. And this will be my highlight value. So when I transfer these two things down, right? I really want to make sure that the separation in those values is somewhat maintained. But the thing is with these two, it's not as important because these are just two areas in the light, right? Because the half tone is very much still in the light. So the most important thing in this particular case to take care of is this particular transition. So in the hardest style of painting, you generally use about five values and the values are like this as follows. You have a value for the highlights. You have a value for the general area of lights called the second lightest light. You have a value for the half tones where the light transitions into darkness. You have a value for the second darkest dark and you have a value for the darks, darkest dark, occlusions and cash shadows. So that is your general breakdown in terms of um, you know the, the overall value hierarchy. That's what this is called. The most important distance, because it's all distance, right? You see me moving all over the uh, the color wheel. The most important distance over here. And the has gun, man. I'll catch you in a bit. The most important distance over here in value. The most important contrast is right here, because we call this the separation of light and dark. Because this whole this whole thing over here, that's the light family, and this th whole thing over here, that's the dark family. And you want to keep the light family and dark family separate whenever you're painting something with the notion of realism because that's exactly what happens in reality it's the selective interpretation as uh, that we do in realism to really ensure that the lights and darks are clearly stated because if they're not clearly stated it's the effect of light greatly diminishes you get a much more washed out image because everything is lit or everything is dark so the aka nothing is lit and nothing is dark because Dark is absence and you know light is addition. So that's the really important thing to remember here. So whenever you're trying to transcribe or change values in any painting, what we really want to think about is maintaining this little distance. And I think that's been done quite successfully in this painting. I think it's been done quite well. Glow has gone. So the contrast itself is managed quite well, and I don't think I'm gonna change that. It's arguable that you know, so you basically took this value over here. And you pushed it you push most of these values there and the idea that you're going with which is the compression of the dark i think it's a fine as a fine idea i would want to point out that there's an alternative way of doing this because not all of this painting is in a crazy amount of light i would almost argue maybe 50 70 75 percent of the painting is not an extreme portions of light right because we have some ambient in the back right over there and we have some directs right over there but if you wanted to go about this an alternate way, an alternate way, because you compress the darks here. So when, what, what I mean by compressing the darks is to say that, you know, you kind of make all the darks a singular value because you want to have more space. And we can talk about that, that doesn't make any sense later on. But you could also compress the lights. Uh, I want you to think about that as well, because this is like a way that I feel like a lot of people are used to doing, which is compression of darks and expansion of lights. But you could do it the other way around. I'm not gonna maybe paint that right now because it takes a lot of time. 
But what that essentially means is that you use your lightest light value, which is, let's just say it's gonna be right over here, and you would basically do the exact same thing but the opposite. So you would really simplify your light areas like this, and then you would add a total crazy amount of information in your shadows, right? You would add a, a ton of information in the shadows like this, and you would begin to complete the painting that way. And it would give you a totally different feel, and that would definitely strengthen the idea of your light source. Right? It's like the camera is being exposed for this. So just another idea to think about here, because that's one, one other way you can do the assignment. Because when it comes to paintings that are generally kind of low key, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, compressed lights or compressed darks. It's, a, it's a completely up to the artist to say exactly how you want to interpret that. Because it's like, what do you want to focus on? What's the majority of the painting on? These are questions that we need to ask and they tie directly into the principles that we're using. As far as what you've done over here, so you've chosen to compress the darks, and I have no problem with that. I think that's a fine, that's a fine idea, it's a fine way of doing it. However, uh, we are missing a few things that are impacting our read, okay? So the shape could be a lot better. You sound like Mo? You mean like uh, like Yasuo? Or is it Mo, like the, the Counter-Strike dude that keeps raging? I, don't, I know that dude, he's pretty funny. I used to watch a lot of like Stewie 2K Tarek videos on YouTube, maybe a couple of years ago. That shit was so fucking funny. Alright, so... A couple of things are impacting the read over here, so we got to be a little bit careful about it. For example, the rim of the light, the rim of the hat rather, we're losing that, and I would like to have that there, because otherwise things get a little bit more ambiguous. Now I always applaud the usage of lost edges whenever you can manage them, but over there in particular, I think I like that. I think I like that in the image, that I'm able to kind of resolve the edge of the hat. I'm a big fan of that. Same over here, so I think... A little bit more attention could be paid, I guess, to exactly how compressed the darks are. And even just having a slight amount, especially when you get to the extreme amounts of dark and light, even a very, very tiny amount of difference of value can indeed have a market difference in the, in the read. So just something like that you can choose to add a little bit more clarity. Again, it's up to your, your, your artistic direction of the piece, how simplified you want to keep the shadows. I, I believe I do like it a little bit more market like this. Has a stream video paused for anybody? Uh, it, sh it shouldn't. Oh, I hope it hasn't. But it's something to consider, right? Because it's not so compressed that you can't add an extra value in the shadow. I think it's because the range is quite, it's quite large still. Because you have this right over here. So that you're working with this entire range over here. So it's not necessarily super low key, um, which might be affecting your read. So you might want to consider lowering your, your brightest bright to be right about here, I would say, you know? Because right now we're having a bit of a conflict, because we have this over here as a light source. I will maybe consider bringing that down a little bit. I got random pauses with Twitch too, I don't know why. Is this new for just today, or... Let me just quickly check my, my frames. Um, I've dropped a couple of frames, but not too much. The video stopped, but the audio was fine. Alright, well, let me know if it persists. It might be, because it's on a new setup right now, so... I don't want to... Uh, to anybody's viewing experience okay so that's some principal talk right talk about exactly how we can try to translate this into the lower key so bring the light down perhaps and also you know consider maybe an extra value because with the current light over here we have some room because if the value is all the way here like if you only had this area of the value space to work with then it could be a very large consideration that we could make saying that okay well i have barely any space to begin with so then I'm going to compress my darks and use a singular dark. That kind of makes some sense to me. But since you have such a large area, I mean, you basically have the entire, the entire value space to work with. So in that sense, why not, right? Why not just uh, throw in an extra value for the darks? Because we, we can have about this much distance. Because what's your, what's your darkest light here? Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I would definitely recommend turning this light down. Because this, this range is a little bit too peculiar to me, because even though everything is lower key and you have this much of a range, I would want the lowest value to be somewhere over here, just for visual clarity's sake. So be a little bit careful about that when you pick the value. Kind of maintain that separation. I know you're thinking lower key, lower key, lower key. But yeah, like I said before, this separation is really what's crucial. So you want to maintain it uh, when you do this kind of paint. So final note about the uh, about the paint that we could do. I'm not going to do a particular paint over with this, because if you're talk just talking principles, it's not like you've done a bad job. I think you've done a pretty good job with the painting. Uh, the last thing that I could talk about is since we do indeed have a large area to work with for the lights and we have compressed the darks, if you really want to bring this painting to much more of a finish, let's say, 
Well, the exact the, what we need to do is to realize that okay, well, I am now focusing on the lights, so let's focus on the lights, right? So we have so much more room in the lights to kind of add these little extra elements here, this extra kind of accent notes, give more detail in the lights. That'll really kind of bring the painting to more of a finish, right? Because we're thinking about more information in the lights, less information in the dark. So let's use more information in the lights. Let's actually take advantage of that. I would not use this value over here. I would make the same value. So we can slowly but surely give you more information in the lights, a little more subtlety. And the more I do that, it suddenly begins to take on a bit more of a of a unique or rather a bit more of a finished characteristic because suddenly, you know, I'm actually making a bold statement here. I'm saying, okay, look at the lights, please. But before, even though you did indeed have more information, I think we could have committed a bit harder. I think we could have committed a little bit harder and that would probably end up with a slightly better image right towards the end of it. Last thing to talk about is the edges. So I don't necessarily know if you're restricting your edges in this particular painting, but because of the fact that you have so little to work with in terms of the value of your darkness, it's really incumbent that we really look at the edges to try and get the read exactly where, we need, where it needs to be. Because when you tone things down and sort of don't care about the edge, it's naturally going to affect the edge. Because like I always say, the edges are not completely, you know, uh, isolated from your, uh, from your values. Because, you know, we, we've seen this classic experiment I do all the time on the stream where I paint the exact same edge. Right, that's the exact same edge, same, and now I use the exact same brush. I do this. So it's the exact same edge type, but the values are different, which makes this on the bottom look way, way softer than this on the top. So you have to consider the impact that you're that it's gonna have on your painting and the read of your painting when this happens. So you might find yourself needing to compensate quite heavily for this. Because a value that wasn't as harsh before, like these over here, those values are now being pushed towards the dark. And that has, even though you're doing it in a decent way, it does have an impact on the rest of the piece, especially when pushed harder. So because it's being pushed so much into the dark, I want you to be careful about how much it's impacting the edge. So what could be a good solution over here is to say, okay, I do want to keep that value over there. However, I want to maintain the same soft read because it's skin and all that stuff. So you go in there and you simply soften that edge up manually using just the, the, the literal edge type. So you soften that up ever so slightly. So you could use an airbrush, use a graphite brush, whatever you like ultimately this is the idea wherever the form shadow is i would slowly start to work in to soften that edge and that would reduce the sharpness because it could look really like, extremely sort of symbolized i guess like very vectorized in terms of image if we don't consider anything with the edge because the edge is important right just because we uh, we toned the entire painting up doesn't mean or toned the entire painting down doesn't mean we can't think about the edges still. So, uh, like I said, I'm not entirely sure you didn't make it clear to me in the crit requ uh, request that you actually required this um, the edges to not be handled. But I think handling them is a good idea, especially because we need to compensate for the lack uh, for the lack of uh, you know, edge management because everything has gotten a lot harder when that dark was pushed much much more into the dark when you flatten the dark. So. You see, everything is getting a little bit more softer, and now you have better correlation with the reference in all these areas. So be a little bit concerned about that. Think about the fact that values and edges, they are not so separate. I think I've given somebody else a similar piece of advice uh, recently. So it's not exactly the same. So just be a little bit careful about that. Where are you from? I'm from India. I'm starting to think it's on my end, because it's happening with other streams too. Okay, cool. Also, hi, Donnie. Good to see you. So be a little bit careful. I want to double check my brush settings for a second. Please. It is acting a little bit strange. Uh, all right. Cool. Okay, so just be a little bit careful about this. So I'm just softening it up really generically. I'm just uh, using like an airbrush or something. So that's the idea. So manage the edges, and it'll give you a much more of a finished look to the painting. I'd surely, but like, like slowly but surely, we get a much better read in some of these areas. And you're missing a read initially. So those are some thoughts about paint. Hopefully, you found this helpful. Also, by the way, uh, I need to do some tests. So I've been doing master studies. Softening edges are a great crit. So the thing is, I don't entirely know. I don't entirely know if um, the point was to keep it uh, so stark. 
But I think this is a really valid thing to think about, that when you change values on a piece, it does come with a price. Because again, edge and value are not completely uh, you know, inextricable. It's really important to think about the fact that uh, they are quite linked. So it's all, it's all um, linked in some way or the other. So it does have an impact. So I've been doing these master studies on stream, so each of them are two hours. I'm going to do one final one right now in two hours. And after which, I'm going to need a picture from the chat. So if anybody has a good portrait of yourself in good lighting, send that over. I don't care if it's in black and white. Uh, color is fine as well. But send me a good portrait because I need to paint something in this style to practice. So I want to just take something from the chat. So it'll be like two hours from now. I'll keep asking every now and again. But if you, get, if you have a good picture, toss it my way, please. It's all very good to see you, man. Also, if anybody's new here, some examples of my own work. I was just doing a crit just now. So, yeah, I've drawn some, a lot of animals recently. Been fun. I've really been enjoying myself. Okay, we have one more thing to crit. Uh, if you guys have anything more, by the way, now's the time. I don't think I'll be critting in the middle of stream. Okay, we have one more thing. Who will be chosen? Who indeed? Let's make sure the lighting's okay. That's all I care about. Yeah, it is India, not Indiana. So, Hoosiers unite, though. Alright, uh, new document. Cool. You know, I actually know who this person is. That's Rachel Bradley right there. Rachel Bradley. It's the wife of Noah Bradley. Noah Bradley is a fantastic artist. Really, really good. He's worked for uh, Magic the Gathering. Okay, so what is the question here? So this is done on the sh on the Discord. Join the Discord, by the way. That's where I'm getting all the all the stuff from. That's where all the pieces go, all the crits go. Everything goes there. So I'm, yes, indeed. Uh, we did indeed talk about your study. We just talked about it just now. Uh, so if you want to rewind the wad, everything's there for you. But yeah, I just looked at it. Not that much in terms of paint over, uh, but just a lot of talk about exactly um, you know what could have been done differently, what could have been done better, and some considerations to be made. But I, don't, I think some of that was useful. Close this to save some RAM. Okay, this is coming from Bloopy on the Discord. He says, uh, Using only a default brush, nothing else to get smooth transitions. Okay. So I'm assuming the, the thought is about edges. So we just talked about this idea in painting wherein it's not sufficient for us to simply modify the edge. Of something so when i say edge so in drawing and realism and painting and all these things we have these like fundamental words we kind of throw around all the time right so we have words like like proportion which everybody understands it's a general word value that means the you know the effective amounts of light or dark in the painting usually done in grayscale and then you have your your shape so shapes are basically there are two dimensional objects that are available on everything that we see that describe the effect of light on three dimensional objects the two-dimensional shapes Describe the lighting on three-dimensional forms. For example, over here, a good shape over here would be something like this, right? You have this like roughly kind of blurry triangle that would be considered a shape, right? Maybe a little bit more clear. You can have a very clear sort of kind of bendy triangle right there to describe the filtering of the mouth, right? Even clearer than that, on the right side of the lip, we have a very clear sort of polygonal shape. So when people do painting, when people do any sort of like study or painting, they don't they realize that they can't kind of paint everything hyper hyper you know, specific especially if time is of the essence and you know you want to add some sort of painterly look to it so we as artists we try to compress what we see we try to simplify what we see and that's where the idea of shapes comes in you don't paint every little nook and cranny you make a bold statement and you put it into your painting good example of that i'll be studying right now look at the shapes on this first so this looks realistic to us right it's got a lot of like visual appeal but it looks realistic and that's exactly what's happening here you see that how distinctly you know, he's thinking about shapes on top of the form, right? So I don't doubt that the reference for this, the reference for this had a myriad amount of different shapes and different values. But the idea is, is that as an artist, you want to simplify what you see, right? Artist sees less, not more. That's your Richard Schmidt right there. So that's what we're trying to do. Because trying to paint little, literally everything that we see is not going to get us too much. Right? It's going to cost us time, it's going to cost us a read. It's not going to have that much visual appeal. So you want to filter what you see. So that's why shapes are important. Okay, so what is an edge now? So an edge describes the transition between two shapes. Simple as that. So you have edges between shapes, meaning that I have this crazy light shape in the forehead, and it transitions into this triangular shape. Remember that one? 
and it transitions softly. That's a soft edge. Similarly, I have this little shape over here, this triangular shape describing the bottom side of the brow on the side of the glabella of the face in the orbit. And this little area is having an extremely hard edge with this dark occlusion shadow near the hair, right? So it's a hard edge right there. And similarly, we even have stuff like lost edges. What's a lost edge over here? Look at the side of the nose, the wing of the nose, right? The wing of the nose over here, is it winglet or wing? I think it's winglet. This sounds better, I guess, but I don't know. But see, we as people, we as artists, we know for the fact that there's, there's going to be a transition here, right? There's going to be a transition here in the nose to the cheek, right? To the orbicularis oris muscle right there. But in the, in the picture that we see, because of the way the picture has been exposed, I can barely, barely see a transition over here. And that's kind of the fundamental idea behind a lost edge. What a lost edge is telling us is that I can't really make out strongly what the difference over here is with the top of the wing, the wingtip, the winglet, the nostril, whatever you want to call it, and this, this side, the side, um, the lateral cartilage of the nose. I can't strongly see a difference. So I'm not going to try and show you a difference because I don't see it. That's really important because you're not trying to describe, you're not trying to show your viewer your knowledge of anatomy. You're trying to give them an idea. You're kind of showing them, you know, what you're seeing. So we can't exaggerate this. Like we can't show this any stronger than we see it. Now it can be a choice, a decision by the artist to say, okay, I do want to show this to you. But as with all things, if you want to call it your style, it has to be intentional, right? Style's not accidental. Because if it's accidental, it could very well be a mistake that you're just, you know, pantomiming as your style. Really, really important to remember this. So style is a selective interpretation. It is not accidental interpretation, right? It's not a mistake that you're kind of, you know, masquerading as a personal stylistic choice. If you're going to do something on the canvas, you should have control over it. So again, lost edge over here. And that's really important to kind of recognize, okay? So you can, you can choose to put that in, you can choose to remove that, but make sure that's a choice. It's indeed a choice, you're not succumbing to it. And there's also color over here, but we don't talk about color right now, it's fine. All right, so let's move on to this particular drawing. I have a, per a personal little bit of a chagrin against paintings like this. Um, not that the, the painting itself is bad, I think it's, it's fine, I think it's pretty good. I think some of the shapes are, are well done, I think the edges are fairly well managed in some cases. Uh, just a little bit of a note uh, to you, which is don't isolate things too much uh, when you're drawing. So don't draw just the face. Now I understand the value of selective study, guillotine, or guillotine rather, good to see you. But I understand the value of selective study, but at the same time, don't just ignore stuff because it's going to create a very incomplete look to your work. And the argument can be made saying, well, this isn't finished. I get that. But it's going to severely skew your own view of your painting as you work on it. And it will create this notion of overworking specific portions of your painting. And I see this all the time with beginners. So whenever I get a beginner crit, I'll see this face that's hyper, hyper rendered, like the nose and the eyes, but then they don't even have hair. They don't have a neck, right? They don't even have any mouth yet. And these people, when they evaluate the painting, they see this and they think that looks kind of bad still. I've got to work on it even more. But really this notion of completion, finish, polish, it's a collective notion. So everything on the canvas will relate to everything else on the canvas. So when everything else is blank over here, it's going to have a severe impact on your read. And you have to understand this. So I'm not saying for a face study or particularly an expression study or an edge study, I'm not saying go into, into extreme detail, paint every single hair. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I'm trying to say that at least have a little bit of a notion of what goes in these areas, because that's going to really help you. Because remember, everything on the canvas is relative. The fact that we're missing this dark occlusion on the side of the face is impacting my read of the side of the face because that's why that's a hard edge. That's not a hard edge because it's just a hard edge random. It's a hard edge because of that reason. So we, we need to put the context in there for it to make any amount of sense. Okay? So let's actually do that. So this is, well, I'm just going to paint over this one. So we'll start right there, right? I'm going to start with just kind of putting a selection around the face. Okay. And we'll go in there and we will cut out wherever the hair needs to go. And I'll, I'll kind of show you what I would kind of at least minimum expectation that I would want to see over here. Okay, let's fill that in really quickly. And you use really basic brushes for this, so indeed for my crit I will also use a pretty basic brush for this. Just fill that hair in really quickly. It goes darker to the left. Keep it nice and simple. 
This is a little bit uncomfortable, by the way. You know what I'm gonna do really quickly? I'm gonna do this because my hand is on top of the reference, and I want to be looking at it. I use a display tablet when I'm just. start to add in this context even the, the light of the neck is also part of the context just make some really 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 rough sort of general notions here because all of this adds everything on the painting affects everything else in the painting really important to start thinking this way but otherwise things will start to become way more incomplete than they need to you don't, you don't need to be incomplete like you you clearly know a lot about what you're doing so be able to present that in a manner that you know it befits you as an artist because it's not like you don't know what you're doing clearly know, you know what you're doing Make sure that's allowed to be shown to the viewer, right? Oh, did I say I was going to use basic brushes for this? Oops, okay, well, I'll remember that from now. Okay, use a round brush. Okay, this is a round brush with 100% opacity, right? Oh, maybe that's a bit too that's a bit too hot right now. That's too hot. Let's use something that's a bit more usable. How about that? That's a round brush with minimum opacity variance. So now I get to add in this dark with context, and it's going to really shine through. All right. So what I want to kind of depict over here, I want to depict the side of the brow right over there. I want to depict the divot. So there's some proportional issues, obviously, here. But I want to have that divot right there, which is the brow kind of curving on the side of the, uh, of the forehead. I want to have this little divot right there. I want to go outwards towards the cheek, towards that zygomatic bone right there. It goes all the way down in here towards the jaw. And I have this kind of read. Right? I have this. And this is going to be strengthened up. Now, I'm basically putting a line here just for my own correction sake. But the point is, I'm trying to search for this shape here. Because there's indeed a shape there. I'm just searching for this. Argument can be made. Well, those zines it looks a little bit too harsh. I get that, right? But I would expect. So I would never paint it in this particular way. This is just for correction's sake. The way I would paint this personally is I would do this, right? I would do all of, all of this first, and then I would paint the hair on top like that. That would be my personal ordering. See how that looks a bit more natural because the edges are managed better. Okay, so I have this right now. So I have a little bit more context than I did before, and then suddenly things are jumping into that slightly more completed state. Now I'm going to do a couple of proportional corrections here, just going to get it a little bit closer to where I want. Not to say that it should perfectly match any reference you paint, that is not the intention, you don't have to do this. However, it's somewhat important, right? Again, like I say that uh, when you study, always it's important to kind of study things specifically, right? Have a particular idea of what you're doing. Uh, and this could be debated, right? I'm not going to try and say there's any optimized way of learning or any, anything like that. There is certainly not any optimized way of learning. The way that it works best for you is the way that I recommend you do this. However, uh, I think it's easier, especially as a beginner, and I still consider myself very much a beginner in a lot of these things. It's easier to kind of like have these very small kind of micro goals for yourself. Think of it like fitness, right? So, so if you wanted to squat 400 like, pounds, 400 kilograms, whatever it might be, if you want to squat that much, then you wouldn't just try and just put 400 on the bar and then squat it down. You set a micro goal, you say, all right, let's try and squat, you know, 200 pounds or 100 pounds, or whatever it is you could achieve. Set basic achievable goals and then complete them, right? So this is really important, not because, you know, you're lowballing your own ability, but mainly because of the fact that you get that kind of success loop. You get little, like, minor victories along the way. And it gives so much of a, of a release of pressure as well. Because suddenly you're not you're not always looking for this one particular goal and failing at every opportunity. You're getting these slight, slight victories here and there. And the pressure is off so you can actually focus on what you're doing. Right? So I really suggest, like whenever you do your study, whenever anybody does any sort of study, just please try and have like a real goal with it. So obviously you can incidentally get some uh, benefit from it, right? Let's say you're studying eyes and you realize something about color, and that's totally fine. But ultimately, if you're doing a study for eyes, you will most likely learn something about eyes because you just focused on it. Something like that. Did you go to an art academy or did you study all of this on your own? This is, uh, I'm almost completely self-taught, I guess. I don't, it depends on whether you consider like online stuff like YouTube and Schoolism and stuff like that, if you consider that as 
um, as formal art training, but I've never been to art school or art, art academy. I want to go. I've been applying, uh, been applying recently. I really want to go and learn. Also, welcome, Nats. Good to see you again. You had some time to draw a little bit. Not spoken. So anyway, we, we got that read. And see, this is kind of helping the painting a lot, isn't it? Because we, we were missing that hard edge. Because it wasn't sufficient to just have a hard edge just mechanically using the brush tip. But the fact that we realized the idea that an edge and a shadow, I'm sorry, an edge and the value is not completely different. Right? That's the oh, real big oh, thing. I can't believe you've done this. That alert was so loud in my ear, by the way. But this is the idea, right? Again, to reiterate that idea, it's that if I'm talking about the edge, let's say I want to achieve a hard edge on my painting, right? It's not just the brush that I use or the tip that I use or whatever. It's really important to realize that also about the value. See, well, this is a, a really easy example to kind of demonstrate that. So I use very similar values, right? And I use very contrasted values. The edge remains the same, right? But when I talk to you about read, then suddenly this reads so much harsher than this, okay? And that's the idea. So don't ever forget that. So when you see a value, that's creating a hard edge, make sure you include that value. Otherwise the edge may never look as hard. Okay. And the same thing applies for any kind of real contrast, right? Because it could easily apply for color contrast as well. Consider this edge. I'll use the exact same value, right? This value over here, that's a, that's a green versus, let's say, the bluish green. Can you see that edge? Barely, right? You can barely see that edge. How about, how about this then? How about a blue, right? Versus this, versus a red. Suddenly you see that edge. So the idea is that all this stuff, they, they do have interrelations. So if ever something doesn't look exactly right, just remember that all of these things, they have some sort of relationship. So the edge, the sharpness of the edge has a relationship with the contrast of the elements composing that edge, not just the type of brush you use for that edge over there. So it's worth considering. So it's just a bit of an additional intricacy, right? Because it's easy to just say, and I, and I would agree, this is how I would teach it as well. I would say for a beginner, like a soft edge does this, you know, you soften it up with a very non-specific ambiguous mark. But it's a little bit more than that. And once you understand a little bit of a more, the principle of why that works, the idea that contrast also dictates the hardness of the edge. When you kind of internalize this idea, it opens up possibilities because rules are great for beginners, but principles are great for intermediates. So when you try to make that, that shift in our work, I think it's really, really good to think about the why. Why did that, why did that, why did that work that way? And we realize so it's, it's, it's good. It's a good thing to think about. Uh, that's impressive. Do you recommend I take a few years to study like you have? Or would it be smart to just go straight to art school? I'm a little conflicted about what to do or what I should apply to do next year, work or apply to an academy. Um, so there are some considerations to be made here because ultimately it's not like you're going to be doing any less work either way. The way that most art centers, art academies, uh, even ateliers, the way they usually work is that you have a minimum amount of instruction. I would say between like seven, to, depending on the place, of course, and how many classes you take. But it'll be, you know, maybe per class, you'd have about seven hours of actual instruction a week. But you'd have so much work to do once you're done with your class. You'll have a lot of work. Frankie, good to see you, man. How's it going? Good to see you again. But you'll have a lot of work to do. And even if you try to do this your own, uh, by yourself, right? You'd have a ton of work to do. Uh, just you lack a little bit of a structure. But with just how good information is uh, currently, especially online, it's, uh, it's very possible. And I've, I've had so many friends that are professionals already that have just done their entire studies on art just online without ever seeing the inside of a classroom. Um, so it's totally possible. Though one thing that would be pointed out, this comes from the artist, um, an artist called Dave Greco, he's another artist on Twitch. He works for like, he's done work for Blizzard and he works in a major studio right now as a senior, I think senior concept artist. But he talks about the idea that it's a great way to network and networking is a, a lot. So once you get the foot in the door, like if you want to work as a professional, once you get your foot in the door in the industry, because somebody somewhere in a classroom that you met five years ago, remembered your name and said your name to an art director, then it would be so much easier for you to make a career as an artist because you have the little thing on, the, on, your, on your CV, on your portfolio that says, hey, I worked for this company for so-and-so, I delivered my deadlines, I got this accomplishment. So that connection to the industry is super important. But even then, with just how networking works these days with Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff, if, you, if, you're, if you're smart with your marketing and if you know how to leverage an existing following, you don't need that, e you don't need that either. Hey, Bazaar, there you go. Bazaar is a prof professional artist. Um, 
already a bizarre there's a question in the chat from from nuts and she asks uh would it be smarter to take a couple of years to study by yourself or would you rather go to art school so i believe everything that you've done bizarre is like self-taught right i'm not uh, mistaken right also we should do this crit i'm, I'm sitting here talking with my hands clasped like a nun um but yeah you don't you don't really need it for like like i said before it's gonna really come from you whichever way you're gonna slice it but having some sort of structure i think is important so my structure didn't come from a from a school it came from just you know rigorous kind of course structure on stuff like schoolism which i do recommend um and also knowing yourself so you know yourself you know what you respond best to like do you respond really well to be like are you, are you really disciplined with yourself like do you get up can you do the work consistently or do you rather have somebody tell you what to do and then you can make the deadline that way but either way no matter how you slice it um it it's gonna take a lot of time it's gonna take a lot of work and you seem that you're you seem totally ready for it so just some things that i talked about earlier are considerations to be made there so connections the structure um and of course the, the work works always okay so uh please don't go to school unless you ha have no idea what you want illustration is very narrow subject so you can find resources easily yeah also depends on what you want to do right so illustration is just one one thing that we can do uh but what exactly are you after you know, what kind of work do you want to do like uh, and if that's not an easy question to answer then who kind of what are the artists that kind of inspire you so we we're talking about lost edges in this particular painting uh, and like i said just because we know for a fact that there is a lateral cartilage on the side of the nose doesn't necessarily mean we have to show it remember you got to selectively think about what makes the image the image and then sort of pull back wherever necessary so in the geneva method of error checking for just realistic portraits number i believe number two or number three in the error check is the idea of do not exaggerate okay and what that means to elaborate is that most people when they see an angle that is semi-vertical they will vertical the angle semi-horizontal they will horizontal the angle and when they see an edge or a bump that is very slight they will exaggerate it it's a very easy thing to see because it's easy to see a difference but it's hard to measure a difference okay so even though you correctly have assessed the fact that there is indeed this thing happening over the over here in the nose allow me to offer you a little bit of an alternative here which is to say that well maybe this isn't this isn't too this isn't too strong maybe the painting will work if i just do this you know does the painting really fail if i do this i don't think it does okay? same idea over here how harsh is this really how harsh is that really because what happens if i do this right it still maintains i still have the read right what about the top of the nostril can i get rid of that okay i get rid of it it still reads right so remember you know all the work that needs to be done it's just that we got to selectively kind of decide where the work is best suited this subtlety management is something that i'm personally struggling with right now like so look at bazaar's work for, for instance pimp your uh, your art station by the way buddy put it in the chat but uh, if you look at like the the delicate kind of value transitions in his work right the, the little the tiny little edge transitions are really really like immense amount of thought behind just what he wants to reveal and what he doesn't that's the kind of idea that we're working with right so what you want to reveal what you want to show because we can't show everything we can't reveal everything we can't have everything with equal emphasis right that's the idea and sometimes you want to show things for example maybe i want to show the side of the nose catching the light right maybe this is an interesting or important thing that i want to personally show in the painting so now i'll reveal it with a little bit of a, a little bit of a light right there i've always wanted to work for a gaming company for a while it'd be a cool thing to accomplish so i'm heading in the same career track as well so that also depends on what you're trying to um you know specifically where you want to work because you know there are a lot of tracks for it and uh, especially depending on how the uh, the company is uh but you know in essence you can be an illustrator for like splash art you can be you know part of the exploratory sketch so you can do initial exploratory sketches uh, or just straight up like bazari said just straight up concept art do character design environment design creature design prop design uh, all that kind of stuff so i'm going to towards the concept design track so you'll find yourself doing stuff like this let me show you something nice so i'll show you some like professional examples so you'll be doing a lot of silhouetting a lot of character sketches a lot of um, orthographics a lot of three fourths stuff like uh like this, this over here like i can just grab something from my own references file stuff that i'm looking at right now to try and study in my free time so you'll be doing iteration stuff you'll be doing design stuff that's what concept is basically for right so if somebody describes an idea to you 
and you iterate it until the point that it becomes the best presentable version of that idea. That's your job as a consultant. So, I, I, I've been doing stuff like this myself. So, the, the whole track basically, so if you want to get into an art school, uh, is they usually ask you to show every stage of the design process. So, if you want to get into that right now, you would have to do something like this. I'll show you the entire, the entire track that I have for like, one of my characters. So, you start with like exploratory silhouette stuff. So, you start with like a very basic idea of what you want. So, in this, this is like a like a Mongolian spellcaster with one arm. That's my idea. And then you, you have initial silhouettes, right? And silhouettes are just the basic stamp. You're just kind of figuring out like where the lights and darks go in the graphic group of things. And beyond that, you finalize stuff, finalize what the design's gonna look like. Of course, this process can look differently for different people, but you kind of finalize things. You get a finalized silhouette. Everybody has their own version of silhouettes. This is just my version of doing it. But it's just a simple stamp of what you want. So once you figure out the basic read, of what you want to do, then you kind of complicate the idea. You build upon it, and you do a bit more exploratory sketching. You do a bit more detailing, a bit more research about your subjects, and you bring those. You bring those very same ideas. You bring them into more of a detail, right? And this is like you can see this for a lot of stuff. Um, for example, here's it for like a nun character. I load that apparently, but you get sketches like this, for instance. And then that, that gets translated into things like this. And so you can see the relationship. It's just been explored further. And then once you're happy with this stage, so it's like the person say, I have this idea. And you say, all right, boss, I'm going to give you the silhouettes. And he'll say, all right, I like these silhouettes. And then he's, he's going to develop it more. And so you develop it more. Right? You show them you know, a little bit more flair to it, a bit more detail. And they say, all right, I like that a little bit more. Uh, then I want you to show me some orthographics, right? I want you to show how this looks in every direction. I want you to develop the idea even further, really flesh out the concept. And then that kind of pushes you into stuff like this, right? You're going to show different angles of stuff, like right? how stuff looks. Um, because ultimately, what's the idea behind game design? A lot of it's going to be in 3D at the end of it. So you need to convert this two-dimensional like two idea into a three-dimensional concept. So you start to do these character sketches, you start to do these orthographics, and kind of determine what things look like from all angles, right? So you'll be doing things like this. Just, I'm just trying to grab stuff that is kind of personal information on it. Like this, for example. So you'll be de deciding where things are. And then finally, if, if, if it all required, you do like some three-dimensional sketches, you do some three-fourths. But that's like the whole design pipeline, that's everything you would do. And you would do this silhouette to sketch to orthographic to three-fourth. You would do all of this for just about everything that's in the, in the game or in the production. So for every character, every prop, every environment, every vehicle, all of it's going to be expected. So you're going to have to show examples of this. Uh, whether it's going to be for applying for a job in concept or applying to a college for concept. Uh, you would expect to have at least this minimum stuff. And of course, uh, it doesn't have to be black and white, and I will always be accompanied with a bunch of illustration work as well to kind of show you know, how this character would look in an environment. Um, but that's the idea. And that's, that's like what, you, what you're going to be looking at uh, if you go down the concept track. And this stuff is, is I would say personally, since I've, I haven't done too much design myself, it's, it's not super difficult in terms of like what you need to understand. But the efficiency is the biggest thing because you really want to be quick uh, with all of this stuff. Like the, I'm not very good at any of this, but my silhouettes take about like a minute and a half, and the sketches take about 25 to 30 minutes, and my orthos, my finished orthos, would take me about at least two hours to start each, and then maybe four to uh, four to five hours to refine. So a lot of work to be done. And that, mine's just in black and white, not even with color. So that's the whole thing. That's what you're gonna look for. If you want to work for like a gaming company for concept specifically, that's uh, that's what's been taught to me at least how uh, how they look for stuff. But remember, the concept isn't exactly isn't isn't the only thing, right? So there are other tracks to go for, like color and light design, storyboarding, uh, you know, the whole three D aspect of it, three D modeling, audio design, you know, sound mixing, all that stuff. Uh, there's general art direction. That stuff like that is is also looked for in the industry. But this is for concept. I know it a little bit more than the other stuff. Okay, so talking about Lost Edges. 
I'm back from a crit. Thank you so much. I swear I'll get plucked with my edges. Okay, so it wasn't intentional. Good, because I didn't know if it was or not. So this read over here is a little bit too strong, and the reason is is because we are ignoring something quite important here. We are we're ignoring the slight little half tone, which is where the light transitions. Because again, if I was to say that this was indeed going to be my final edge, what is translating to the viewer? Because this is what edge, edges tell us, right? It tells us exactly how the transition is. So if I was going to say it's just this much value, what it's telling me is that the side of the cheek is not curved like this. It's harsh. I go from a light to a dark. But it's not that way. That's why it looks a little bit weird. So if it's indeed curved, I have a light, I'll have a half tone right there, and I'll have a dark right there. So, so the notion that we're trying to build up to, every one of us is trying to build up to, is can we justify every stroke? Does every stroke have a purpose? Do we know what that purpose is? And slowly but surely, as we build ourselves, build our understanding, our visual library, our ability to kind of perceive what reality is and what the components of reality actually, you know, tends to be in artwork, then we're going to be able to get to this point where we're able to justify stuff and then figure out stuff. Because once you figure out the underlying principle of why something is something, then you get to play with it. And that's what's going to create, create like really good illustration. Because that's the way I see it myself. So once you figure out why something works, then you get to play with that idea. And I like that. I, I like thinking that way. Because it's fun. Like, if I figure out this, then I can figure out like five or six different things if I can just kind of throw ideas around from that baseline. And it's, that's really interesting to me. It's like catching a Pokemon and then being able to use it in your star in your star list. You know? just adjusting some new values. Like I said, I'm not even touching your edges all that much. I'm just adding values that are, where they're kind of missing. So when it comes to really dark areas in your in your piece, there are certain things with occlusions. So artists like uh, so Istvarak is a really popular artist. Bazari loves her. You love her. <laughs> you really like this artist, don't you, Bazari? So it, it's not how you spell it, I'm dyslexic. It's the break. There you go. She talks about areas of occlusion on the on the face. And there are a few of them. So one of them is right here. She talks about the was that pupil, cornea, one of those things. On the eye, nostril, right over there. Nostril is usually dark. The little sides of the lips right there. Quite dark. And she says these are like the most formative elements. And the reason is, is because if something wants to be this dark, you have a pretty good reason for that to be that dark, right? It's got to be really embedded, really occluded, really blocked from the light. Because if the light had its way and it was shining everywhere, everything would be equally, equally bright, but that's not how things work. Nos, good to see you. Nadaski, good to see you as well. That's how, that's how things, uh, we've got to think about things that way. So, can we justify this dark? Same way, there are some slightly darker elements we can expect in certain areas. For example, this area on the side of the eye, called the tear duct, if you want to lose points and regain your virginity, you can call it the lacrimal caruncle, what this is called. That's usually a little bit darker, because it's exposed flesh. It's also darker, but sometimes reflective, because it's sometimes a little bit teary. So putting that in can sometimes add just a little hint of realism, just a little bit of a hint. Overall, in terms of the structure, I really want to focus on this for a second here, because I've been fixing the edges all this time. I've been talking about why the edges aren't working, but realize that we're doing something that is very crassly and called in most artist circles. It's called turd polishing. Uh, so I'm not going to use that because it's really stupid. I think it's excessively harsh. But the idea is is that the you the initial portion, the initial part of this image, like your work already, this is not bad at all. It's actually quite well done. But the reason that it's looking a little bit more like bulgy in certain places is just because the drawing underneath the painting is a little bit weak. And it's drawing attention away from your rendering because I'm, I'm pretty sure that with a, with a few minor tweaks this will look totally fine look totally fine you're really not, not that far off so i want to want you to take a little bit of time to just think about that overall drawing element before jumping into the rendering i feel like looking at the way this has been painted i don't think that you've used any lines for it i think um this was painted just straight up using shapes and i commend that i don't think i have a single problem with people not using lines because i barely use lines to begin with myself However, be careful about your measurement. The whole notion that people talk about is the idea that drawing is two-thirds painting. It's an old adage from 100 years ago, but it is completely still valid in the modern day. Please, please take care with your proportions with your drawing, because otherwise, it doesn't matter how good your rendering is, it doesn't matter how good your edges are, it's going to affect the painting severely. Okay, And the better your rendering is, 
the more it's going to call attention to the fact that your drawing may not be as good. And it's not like you don't know how to draw. I've seen your other work. I know you can draw. Just remember to keep that focus, okay? So before you jump into the rendering, into these juicy edges, don't ever lose sight on that. And I, I totally understand that it's totally possible for this to happen all the time, because sometimes when I'm studying edges, for example, or studying something, it distracts me from the fundamental. And I think, okay, edges, 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 edges. But then I completely forget, forget about the idea that, okay, I actually have to draw this picture. And I can't forget about the actual stuff because edges, while they're important, are not the most important things. And sometimes you can get a bit confused, right? Because we focus a bit too much on things that we're studying. But remember that the baseline is still the baseline. So establish the baseline and then focus. So we're going to try and show you what that looks like a little bit. So we can see some really basic simplifications. And I really encourage you guys, I encourage everybody, uh, including myself, because I forget this all the time, please try and be a lot more simple with your construction, at least at the beginning. So you'll see me, at least if I'm doing my job right, you'll see me all the time kind of doing my block with extremely straight lines, like this, for example. And it does make a lot of sense because when you consider the face, the face plate, the way everything is built in its most simple form, these things don't deviate too far away from each other. Like, imagine a mannequin's face. A mannequin's face is not too far away from an actual person's face. Granted, it lacks a lot of detail, but overall, it's quite similar. And that's worth considering because the fact that we don't have this kind of like crazy, crazy bulge happening in the face because look at the actual coordination. It's actually not that far off, right? It's very subtle. So thinking about it as its simple form and then complicating, as opposed to complicated form first, you can really help set things into motion. So you, you don't make this exaggeration too heavy. So there's a lot to, uh, to address here in that respect. I think we got a little bit closer with the whole idea of adjusting the value over here. And that was, that was a decent change. However, to really bring this painting to a good conclusion, I strongly, strongly recommend just going a little bit back into the, into the value. So uh, I could attempt maybe to do this with liquefaction, but I, I have no guarantees because I don't, I don't tend to liquefy too much on my paintings. Um, or at all, if I can avoid it. But you can try it out though, because you know what? I don't use this tool very often and I don't really know how to use it. So why don't we just try and use it, right? Why don't we just try and get better at it on, on screen? So let's just do that really quick. Bro, man, welcome, man. Just doing some crits before we start today. So, where's the liquefaction here? I, okay, it's right over here. I think. Um, it is warp, I believe. Oh goodness, my age is gonna show now. Um, <laughs> shit. It's uh, it's warp, and then you subdivide, I believe. Subdivide like that, and then you kind of play with these points. Is that right? Well, I'm, something's happening. I can't guarantee that it's good, but something's happening. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, oh it's, all, it's all going wrong. We're gonna need more points. <laughs> so, man. Need more points. I must construct additional pylons. Oh, this is so uncomfortable to look at. Poor Rachel, man. So beautiful. We're doing this to her. This is gonna look so <laughs> janky. <laughs> this is why I don't do this. Look what's happening. Look what we did. We're ruining a good painting. Alright. Uh, do I dare apply this and see what it looks like? Uh, I'd call that an improvement, you know, to a certain extent. Well, just stuff to get it into a little bit more of a human direction of what we're trying to do. Like I said, I very, very seldom use uh, liquefaction stuff like that. I like to make nice solid changes because my, my workflow is very traditional. So. Little changes like that. I think that's Solmir. They're definitely not believing in me. I think we'd get it somewhere, right? Let's say. I believe in you. Maybe not the, not the tools you sometimes use. It's true. Don't say what you use. Not like that it's bad, by the way. Nothing's really bad. If anybody tells you that this is a, it's an illegitimate way of drawing, uh, that person may, may be full of shit. You uh, point something out. If it works and it's not hurting anybody, probably fine.
Well, at least we're getting, we're getting closer. Gotta fix some angles. Is that someone you know? Uh, this is Rachel Bradley. Not somebody I know, but I know of this person because she's the wife of Noah Bradley. She's also a really, uh, really good artist herself. But I know her through Noah because Noah is somebody that I'm really inspired by. He's a Magic the Gathering artist. Works with backgrounds. Really, really good dude. He's so responsive as well. I should point this out. I talk to, like, I try to message a lot of artists because I just want to, like, learn from him, right? But this, Noah, I think, is consistently the person that responds to me the most on Instagram. Like, he always answers my questions, which is, you know, big props to him. Like, I try to be really good at that, like, right now. Always answering questions, but yeah, he, like, that dude's a, yeah, he's just a good dude, man. I like him. I'm gonna be like him someday. I'm gonna grow up to be Noah Bradley. Koi, welcome. This looks great, thank you. The original artist is, who is it? Loopy on the, in the Discord? Yeah, Loopy on the Discord. You can go check out the original work right over there. I think I'm just about done with this, by the way. With the, with the, with the old crit. I think we got uh, a solid chunk into this. Raven Minar, good to see you. We're just doing a crit right now. Uh, we just... Uh, are helping somebody out with their painting, but we're going to be painting ourselves quite soon. So I think I talked about a lot of stuff. Forget about the painting itself, because it's okay. I mean, it's, I think I did some okay changes. But the overwhelming thing with all of these crits that I always try to stress about is the principle, right? Why does it work? Why, why does all of this work? Because if you think about principles, it, it's like teaching a man to fish, right? It's like teaching a man to fish and giving a man a fish. One of them really serves for an extended period of time, the other one, not so much. So just think about that. Okay, I'm gonna leave it right here. Uh, my handwriting is not legible, even slightly, so I'm just gonna get rid of it. What about hitting a man with a fish? Well, that'll also teach him a lesson. Maybe not about fishing, though. All right, I'm gonna export this one because it's actually a paint over with this one. And uh, can somebody give me a timestamp, please, for the stream right now? So I can uh, read the person. Um, let me see. One of five, thank you. Oh, I have a DM on Discord. Let me see. Oh fuck, I can't believe you've done this. Raymond, thanks for the follow, man. I do appreciate it. 105... When did I start this? I have no idea. Um, whatever. I'm just gonna say it ends at 105, you know? Let, let, let the person do some work. I muted my mic. I muted my mic. I'm sorry. My, my mic mute is on caps lock. I answered. I was literally answering everybody's questions. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. 
Um, I don't even know where to where to begin with my apology, but yeah. So this thanks kicking, I think, for the sub. Maybe if he was muted then, uh, there was a substantial tangent. I'm not quite sure how I answered that question, but just as you said something clever, two months in a row. Yeah, thanks. Dude. I really appreciate that. Do you use the smudge brush or the mixer brush? So mixer brush is a Photoshop thing. I don't use Photoshop. I use a free program called Krita. And I don't tend to smudge my work too often. I smudge when I want to get a lost edge. But usually the question, Raymond, when it comes to brushes, is usually about what kind of edge I want to do. Because the point is, is I can use a really fancy looking brush, right? I can use something like this, okay? Uh, let's say this is like a fancy brush. This is like one of your art station brushes right here. Holy shit, look at that brush, it's crazy. But the point is, is that if I, if I keep doing this with that brush, it, it just looks like any normal brush, basically, right? So the application really matters. And in painting like this, when you want to kind of get a more traditional look to your work, you want to reveal the tooth of your brush, right? I call this, I don't, even, I don't know what the technical term is, but I call this the tooth. You want to re reveal the tooth. You know, the tooth will, will set you free. So I like doing that a bit more. So you want to show that. So alternatively, Craig Mullins, for example, one of the grandfathers of concept art in general, he would tell you to always use a, a, a brush with an edge, use a brush on the diagonals, right? Use them on the diagonals. Because what happens is that when I do this, right? And that's probably a bad example for the brush. When I do something like, like this, for example, when I, when I go all over the place, it kind of flattens it out. Now I don't really have a clear edge, but when I paint on the diagonals, Suddenly I have this beautiful, this toothy fruity edge to the brush. It looks kind of cool, right? He calls this one of the principles of industrial rendering. So Craig Mullins, uh, he's a mouthful, he's a, he's a mindful, and he's probably forgotten more art information than any of us will ever know. But it's worth considering, right? Worth considering these ideas. So the, 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 the principle is that to show the tooth, show the tooth of the brush. But again, how well do you understand hard edge and soft edge? Did I, was I muted for anything else? I think the last thing that I said is I'm probably gonna pick the portrait uh, that Nuts gave us. You guys can feel free to keep posting portraits, by the way. This is the only one that I got, so I'm probably gonna just pick this one. But um, I wanna be using um, some fresh uh, reps to kind of test my knowledge of what I just learned from my Lavier studies. So I'm gonna be probably picking this as the pin of the day right there. You probably ask permission if I can let other people paint along with me as well. Uh, I don't think that was interesting. Hold on, let me quickly set the DM back. I, I hit cast lock again. Um, I'm actually going to disable. <laughs> I kind of want to disable that. Hold on. Um, create an empty layer, apply bevel emboss, and then the brush strokes. I can, yeah, that can be done, uh, Glow, but it's very um, CPU intensive. It can be done, though. I hope that answered your question, by the way, Raymond. I, I hope my mic wasn't muted for that. I'm going to quickly just disable my, my shortcut because it's annoying right now. Did I talk? If I ever don't talk on the stream and I didn't mention that I'm leaving, it's mostly because I either messed the hockey up or somebody broke into my house and killed me. So yeah, just if ever I'm quiet, just let me... Uh, Alright, let's quickly go to the hotkeys. How about control and caps lock? I don't use that very often. Uh, quickly search and forth. Oh, not what I want to do. It's all going wrong. He's messing. <laughs> he's messing it all up. Shut up, Nas. All right. Um, mute. Right. Uh, and. Get rid of this, get rid of this, and we'll make it 
full cast. All right, we good, chat. All right, fixed it. Yeah, all good. I was asking because the mixer brush is great for the... Yeah, I 100% agree. Let me tell you, uh, there's so many paintings of Rakowski that I've seen that just use exclusively almost mixer brush. And uh, I would love to do it, but I think I, I get by with uh, with my current methods, but I would certainly love to use it. I can only approximate it, but it's fun. Uh, it, it's fun regardless. Romance, see you later, man. Erica, good to see you. Oh, sorry. Trombley. Sergeant Trombley. Attention. Okay. Um, do me a favor for you um, stream watchers, because I know there are a few stream listeners, but if there are any stream watchers in the chat, um, do tell me if things are being obscure on the screen, okay? Because I've restructured some stuff, um, so I don't really know if something's going to get covered. But do let me know. Alright, master study time. Do you find it difficult to focus on art while there's chat questions? No, no, never. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not like it doesn't draw away from my attention, but I'm just so used to it at this point that it, I can't complain about it, like I legitimately can't, like I've been doing it for enough times that I'm able to just maintain a very, very steady stream of communication. My art does suffer a little bit, but not to the point where I'm personally like, ah, oh, this, the, the, this is the worst decision I've ever made. I don't, I don't really feel that way. Uh, it was very difficult to, to begin with, but um, I'm not slouch when it comes to voicing thoughts and just generally speaking, this whole multitasking thing has gotten easier the more that I've done it. And it's not like it's a unique thing to me. It's uh, yeah, it's it's easy to kind of get this. You just practice. It's just like any skill. The more you do something, the easier it becomes. Okay. Great stuff on IG. Cheers, Dot. Good to see you, man. Go follow Dot as well, fellow streamer. Does a stream similar to mine, but way handsomer. There's a boss of painting and responding to chat. Yeah, I mean, you want to see what I look at when, I, when I'm working? So my chat actually. Oh well, you can't see that, can you? Right. Hold on. I fix. I fix. No, that's not doing it. All right, let me quickly tech support myself. Huh. Well, I guess you can't see it, but basically my chat's on my screen right now, directly on my screen. So um, it's really close to my, for example, my chat's right here. Like, you can't see it, but I can see my chat transparently on my window, so I don't even have to look that far away. But I need my reference. Now that he's changed his mute keybind, he should go from B plus to A in responding to the chat. <laughs> why, are you, why are you hunting me today, Nos? What did I do? Is it because I didn't choose you for the portrait? Fine, I'll fucking paint you as well. Jesus Christ, get off my back. Wow, transitions? We're, we're using Streamlabs OBS right now. We can't judge the handsome bit without a webcam. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean... Where would I even put the webcam? I don't have a space for that. Also, it's, I really enjoy just streaming without any clothes on. So, comfortable for me. Gotta be free, man. Alright, I think that is it for the talky talky portion of this uh, particular stream and the crits. Let's start painting. Uh, it's gonna be pretty important that we do some painting on this. Fairly important. Okay. I'm gonna do a quick little latency test. That's actually not bad, you know? That's not bad. That's way better than we, we usually get on the stream. So I'm, I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, can I make this a bit more character focused? I do love the background, but I, I want to paint the character. Uh, I don't particularly care. Oh, it feels so bad to do this, but I don't really um, want to paint the composition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick little crop of this painting. I will take the burden of illustrating you. Streaming from imagination. I want to see that. I want to see what you think I look like. I mean, the pictures out there. It doesn't take too much time to search for them. Because uh, there, <laughs> there have been several people on the stream that have excessively stalked me and found most of my information. So I don't encourage it. 
but it's not like it's hard to find. All right, so what am I doing? Uh, got a quick check for my painting. All right, this is the painting in question. We open it up in a new document and we do a quick little crop and then re-import. Uh, how much do we want to crop here? God, I love the strokes. It's so beautiful. It kills me. Not that much. We save that. And we get a new reference. Nice. Because the less size of the canvas I need to work with, the better. Now, a couple of things, a couple of uh, good best practices while before we work is A, I'm going to reduce the size of this reference because you want to be site sizing, we don't, you don't want to be transferring measurements, and we want to focus on some basic elements of this. We're not going to be painting this for too long, maybe an hour and a half, maybe two hours at the most. So we'll keep it nice and simple. Secondly, cut this, uh, this canvas roughly in that shape of what we're going to be painting. How about that? Easy enough. And we're done. So we're going to take a sip of water and paint this for about two hours. Let's see how well we do. Like police border reconstruction. <laughs> My birthday's coming up, by the way. So if you want to just all give me uh, what you think I look like painting, it will be fun. Um, it's in January. All right, so here we go. Three, two, one. Why, why it not work? Oh, it's because this thing is behaving badly. Okay, now it's going. Three, two, one, go. All right. The first thing that I want to do is I want to liven up. You have a beard, don't you? I do not. Clean shaven. <laughs> Already off to a bad start there, Raymond. I used to have a really copious mustache though. It was it was fine for the most part, but then it was brought to my attention that I, I was going through a very difficult time, as you usually do in your first year of like college or whatever. But I was brought to my attention that my, my wardrobe, for whatever random reason, consisted of mainly like long trench coaty sort of stuff. And I had this really wispy like there's no other way to say it. It was like a like a like a predator mustache, right? It was a predator mustache. And somebody brought that to my attention, I shaved that shit off the same day. Never, I've never had it again. I will never ever succumb to that again. That was before I lost all my weight and stuff. I was still a chubby boy. Chubby boy in a large trench coat. Brown as, brown as could be. Hiding out in the alleyways and shady spots of the bar. Okay, getting this basic notion of the background. I like to spend a little bit of time. On the background before I begin painting. But now indeed we are done with the background. So let's go and start separating things out. So the first thing that I'm gonna start doing over here is separate out the focus, the little character over here. I'm gonna separate that out from the background because the background consists of these dark reddish kind of maroon tones. And I don't want it to be bleeding through. I want something to bleed through on my main character, but I don't want it to be this. So I definitely don't want it to be this. So in that respect, I'm gonna be strongly thinking about Maybe putting this just a little bit warmer, you know, as a base color, something like this perhaps. Just maybe a bit more neutral, so I'm not fighting the value too much. Just a neutral color, just to kind of liven up the canvas. And I want to cut the harshness of the edge a little bit more. Or just apply a couple of strokes just to kind of slowly remove the harshness as much as it was. Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. That's the follow count. You like the Indian Bob Ross? <laughs> what would the Indian Bob Ross sound oh, like? I can't believe you've done this. All right, now they're going to take the brush and we're going to beat the living Shiva out of it. <laughs> that would be awesome. I would definitely watch that. All right, so we kind of prime the canvas right over there for the face. And now we're going to quickly get something off for the hair. I'm going to apply an ochre color, very similar to the hue of the street outside my building. Is that racist? I can say that, right? I'm actually Indian. I can say that. I was born and oh, fuck it. I don't care. Bam me, Twitch. Bam me. Even that post on live stream failed. Give it to me. Okay. Uh, let's just add a little bit of this base color to the hair. Just priming stuff up. He says devil, not shit. <laughs> not, not shit, it's Shiva. Or Shiv we say Shiva. Shiva is the god of destruction. I can't believe you've done this. Thanks for the follow, by the way, guys. We're just priming this canvas up, man. I gotta prime this canvas. 
I don't like painting on dead canvas. Have I mentioned that? I don't like dead canvases. I have a personal chagrin towards them. Because way back when, your boy, your boy Indian abroad, way back when, I used to spend maybe hours and hours, not even hours and hours, I spent the majority of a week on one painting. And it bothered me. Not to say that's a bad thing. And if you do that yourself, don't feel affronted by that, uh, by the revelation. But it bothered me because I never got anywhere. I never got anywhere with it. And I, I don't like that. I'm somebody that really craves progress. If I don't progress on stuff, it really fucking bothers me. So when I came back to painting after about five years of a hiatus, it really mattered to me the fact that, you know, I really wanted to not do what I did before. So not that there's anything wrong particularly with, um, with painting at your own pace or whatever, there's nothing wrong with it, there's really nothing wrong. Uh, however, just a, like a personal, I guess, traumatizing incident before. So I like to have everything nice and lively, not, uh, you know, not super staticky. I don't want to be staring at the grayscale canvas underneath my painting for too long. Just a personal little thing like that. But thank you for the Bob Ross comment. I've gotten it a couple of times, and it's very sweet. It's a very sweet comment. I don't try to necessarily emulate Bob Ross. I'm just, just trying to explain what I'm doing. Because personally, when I was first on Twitch, I love the people here, especially the art community. It's something special to me. Very near and dear to my heart. However, uh, I always used to bother the people on this platform. I always used to bother them. Because I used to ask, why did you do this? Why did you do that? You know, what's the purpose of this? You know, do you know, I mean, wh why did you make this particular decision with the color? Why is that dark? Why is that light? And I felt a little bit bad about it. Felt a little bit a certain way about it. So, when I first started shaving myself, I really wanted to, uh, to just have everything out there to begin with. So people would talk to you about their day, about their dog, you know, about the, the, the type of sandwich they had earlier today. I'll talk to you about what I'm thinking about for art. Uh, nothing wrong with any of those things. Just how I, I choose to run this whole thing. And it helps me a lot because, I mean, I really need to know what I'm talking about because let me tell you, there are some people in my chat and I love them. I honestly do because they will call out my bullshit and I really appreciate that because I'm no master of any of this. Right? I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about half the time. Uh, I know something about it. I know a vague, parroted version of it. But do I really know it? Like, do I know it? Know it? Not really. So being challenged like that, just putting your thoughts out there and being challenged, or reiterating things, testing ideas, it's a good thing. It's a good, good, healthy thing. I followed you on Instagram. Thank you. Thank you for following my thingy. Appreciate that. Okay, so we're just going to mask out some basic, basic ideas. So this is what he calls the scaffolding. So I've studied a lot of how John Levera, I'm sorry, Lariva works. So he calls this a scaffolding phase. He's going to make a couple of marks around the painting. They're going to figure out what his distancing, his measurement's going to be, right? So let's do that ourselves. So let's grab something that's somewhat neutral. Uh, that's not neutral, is it? It's a bit too dark. The reason that actually matters, the reason that matters is because I don't paint on multiple layers. This is all on a single layer. So I don't get to turn off my lines, which means that this dark bleed through is going to kill me. It's going to kill me if uh, if it's too dark, because you'll have a beautiful light patch of, uh, of skin right over there and then harsh, dark transition coming out of nowhere. And we don't like that too much. Let's define the glabella really quickly. Can I just draw a line to the center of the face? Does anybody, is anybody bothered by that if I do that? Maybe not that, not that dark, though. maybe a little bit lighter. Okay, later. Good luck. I'll come hang out at some point again. It was a pleasure having you. Actually, good luck the rest of the day. All right. So do some basic, your basic fundamental bread and butter lumis measurement. So top of the top of the brow, I'm sorry, top of the hairline right there, down to the top of the brow right over there. Bring it down further to the bottom of the nose. I'm going to approximate that and say it's somewhere over there. Right, bottom of the nose right there. And then take the same distance, bring it down further. That'll give you a bottom of here. Oh, easy piece. Find your glabella, said, said the sage to the <laughs> Solmer. Find the glabella. You must find the glabella inside. Thanks for the follow, by the way, Anari. I don't know why my alert didn't go off. Is there like a severe delay on the stream? I don't know. Use a layer for guides. That is annoying to switch. Yeah, I don't like switching. Let's do it the hard way, right, John? Do it the hard old way. I like it hard over here. All right. To find the bottom of the eye, usually the algorithm is take this distance, Divide into thirds, and the top third over here, this little line, gives you the bottom of the eye. So it's one third, two third, and then three thirds. So I'm going to say approximately somewhere over here, bottom of the eye. It's going to vary, of course. These are just general rules. These are general, general rules. But the rule is going to give you almost like this, this fail safe, right? No matter what I do, if I follow the rules, it's not going to look like an alien. That's the kind of idea. So it gives you a restriction. 
So things are not going to go crazy, crazy out of proportion, or perspective, or out of proportion, or you know, out of the realm of possibility for a human face. That's the kind of idea. So you can exaggerate within those within those restrictions, a little bit here, a little bit there. But in general, there are some general rules that we can do follow, and help us out a lot. Like I said before, when I was uh, doing a crit, I like to keep my lines really, really, really straight uh, when I do it at this point. I, I really do like not um, looking at subtlety because me personally, I just want to jump. I want to jump and do those those little itty bitty satisfying curves. So restricting myself at this point is really valuable to me. I'm going to divide this area into half to find the top of the eyes. Right over there. We're currently in the middle, in the midst of the socket. And that's the top of the eyelid. Right over there. Just making some marks. To find the bottom of the bottom lip, take the distance over here. Now this is the algorithm, not the it's, it's not the rule, it's an algorithm. So just a basic idea of what, what you can expect. To find the bottom of the chin right over there. And bottom of the nose, we'll divide that into two. That's usually around where your bottom of the lip is going to be. Okay? Easy enough. Half of the eye? Yeah, not this kind of distance. So I'll take the overall cavity of the eye and just cut that into two to kind of get the top. That's approximately where it's going to be. It's a distancing thing. So eyebrow goes over here and the top of the eye goes over there. That's what I meant. Okay, so find the, um, the bottom of the bottom lip. Easy enough. I'm going to simply mark like a little bit of a divot here for the center of the mouth right over there. And to find the size of the mouth, I'm just going to cut a line through maybe where I approximate the center of the eye is going to be. And make a couple of vertical strikes right over there. We call this a plumb line, by the way. Plumb P L M P L U M B, I believe it is. I have an emote for it, but I've still I've completely forgotten what the actual word is. I can construct the rest of the mouth really quickly from that. Easy peas, just like that. Uh, I strongly encourage, by the way, when you think about the the bottom lip, don't construct it as you know as if it's a stamp. You know, this is a very iconographic way of um you know drawing the mouth but remember that the mouth doesn't really look like that structurally structurally you're more accurate doing something like this saying that you have this muscle these muscles these muscles wow these muscles on both sides of the lip right over there and you have a divot for the shadow you see that because in the finished painting you can see that little character right there de depicting exactly that same thing happening so when i draw this stuff over here it really does matter to me to have the kind of structural information also please tell me if anything's being obscured i need to know what Meaning that if any, if this color wheel is blocked in my painting, I need to know about that. Okay, uh, you know what I'm gonna do quickly. It's pause time. I'm gonna move this entire thing a bit down. There. I think that's a better change because I paint a bit higher. Okay. Zoom. I'm gonna block out some majority shapes because right now we're doing scaffolding, which means we're not trying to do line art. I'm not trying to get a line art of this painting right now. It's not my my business. I really want to get. Just basic understanding of where to do my placement because all I care about in this painting is the painting itself. I want to do this painting. So at the end of the day, this, these lines are never going to really show. They're not going to be there at the end of it. So I want to just quickly get just enough so that when I make my initial paint strokes, they're done with some amount of precision. That's all I care about. Okay? Get the triangle from the top of the nose. Easy peasy. That is, if you want to get specific, I believe that's called the greater ALR cartilage right there. The ball of the nose. A couple of lines for the bridge right there going into the, na the nasal bone? Nose bone? What is it called? One of those things. Nose bone. Nasal bone. Put up there near the cabello. Alright. So the overall face itself within this voluminous amount of hair. Reading a bit small right now. Uh, we can make some corrections in a bit. But let's quickly kind of ascertain where the side of the face is going to be with these renewed measurements. The side of the face is going to be right about, I would say, right about there. I can get my negative spaces. Maybe a bit closer than that. How about right about there? Just. Nice and easy. Let's make the correction. Just kind of getting the overall silhouette where it needs to be. And fixing some of the angles, because the angles, especially on top of the, the forehead, really, really important. Now that I have that, there's a decision to be made. Do I spend the time kind of cropping everything in, or do I bring this larger? I will choose to bring it larger. So we'll just grab this really quickly. Right? A quick little change here. Just be nice and nimble with the painting. Grab it. Increase the size of it. Be a bit more in proportion with everything else that I've done in the silhouette. Have it right now. I can leave it right there. Easy enough. Okay. If the nose is cartilage. Why is no nose present in the skull? You answered your own question. Because it's cartilage. Here we go with the lo-fi hip-hop tracks. My goodness. I don't know where they get their samples from. Alright. 
I'm gonna define some majority shapes, shadow of the nose, shadow of the eyes, right there. And also bottom of the uh, of the jaw right there. Always a difficult little place for me to kind of navigate. But we can indeed keep it nice and simple at this point, keep it nice and simple. But how does it look? Wait, what do you mean how does it look? I need to index, I need to use your words here. Thanks for the follows. It feels like my my alert is completely off right now. Okay, I reset it. It should work now. But thanks for the follow. I think it's Cry Trunk. Thanks, dude. We're doing a, the final master study. I've done two, two of them before. Take about two hours each. So these are the final ones we're doing right now. Okay. So a couple of shapes just to kind of finish this whole line drawing up. Not line drawing. It's called a block in. Sometimes called scaffolding. Sometimes called lay in as well. You hear these words thrown around. So whenever somebody says block in, lay in, scaffolding, this is what they're talking about basically. Beautiful eyes. This this, this artist, so John Lariva, by the way, is his name. His eyes are spectacular. I cannot, cannot get a, get a, get over them. Okay, so this is the extent of my blocking, right? I can maybe add additional marks. Maybe some tight little guidelines for the eyes, for example. Show you where the uh, the eyelid kind of terminates into the eyebrow. We could make marks like this, for instance, give us a bit more information, and maybe kind of stray away from the algorithm a bit more, giving myself a little bit more, you know depth in the eye, the upper eyelid, kind of giving myself a bit of variance. But these marks, I don't traditionally tend to use them in my work. Uh, there probably will come a time where I might use them, may not use them. But, you know, it's sufficient for me to just stick with what I already have. I think that's enough for me to paint. Paulie, thanks for the bits, by the way. I think that just showed that my alerts are still not working. <laughs> I don't know why that's happening. I do appreciate you, though. They probably sample from public... Yeah, you're probably right, Machiavelli. I know you know, right? Okay, so now it's time to paint, okay? Easy peasy. So we need to first start, well, if you want to do, the, do it the way the artist does it. What the artist does is he does a couple of things to begin the painting. The first thing is that he'll pick in his mind, he'll say, I want this painting to have a warm light on the light in the light area. So I want to have a warm light area, a cool dark area, a coolish red dark area. He kind of mixes his paints first and then he paints and he starts from dark to light. But he does this thing occasionally where he'll say, okay, the, the skin's going to be generally quite warm, so I'm going to mix in some complementary or cooler tones so that it bleeds through the painting, right? It bleeds through my strokes and it gives you a little bit of vibrancy in the skin. So we can choose to do this right now because right now we're probably going to be painting the skin with something like a decent red, decent yellow, something in that range. Uh, but we could easily start to put in just a little bit of an accent note or a complementary color somewhere here. We could add, maybe add a bit of a bit of green, a bit of blue underneath here, a bit of decent color. And we can kind of start putting a little bit of this on here just to begin with. Just to, just to kind of attempt to replicate stuff. Because there is going to be a significant, significant amount of bleed through on my painting. So let's start with a couple of these notes. Just to begin with. Just to start things off. A couple of accent notes the bleed through on the face in a few of these areas especially where it's not a, a complete area of light okay so once i'm done with this easy enough we'll start blocking in these majority areas of shadow right so it's going to be form shadows on the cheekbones maybe a little bit of cast shadow on the neck all these things are going to have to be sorted out so we're not going to resolve the silhouette just now we'll resolve the silhouette in a bit but we'll just start with a very simple thing so i'm going to pick this shadow color that i already have over here and I'm going to add a bit more red to it, like that. And I have this as my resultant. I'll just pick it. Because remember, I'm not really going for the final color that's going to go here eventually in the piece. I'm just going for something that's vaguely close. And I just want to start laying in some local kind of value relationships. Because when it comes to the initial part of the painting, a lot of it is you're trying to build up a good understanding of what you're looking at. Because what you want to do is to have everything coordinate with itself really well. And that's what you're, like, what you're really aiming to do with this kind of painting, with any kind of painting. So what is the concept of a wasted stroke in, in artwork, right? What is really a wasted stroke? It's a stroke that you're making that doesn't feature in the final painting and doesn't really lead you to the final painting. And an underpainting, like we're doing right now, it's in the second category. It leads you to the final painting because it helps you think about just the arrangement of the value and the arrangement of the local color as opposed to thinking about everything. What is the final color? What is the final value? Just the relativeness. And it does really help you in the painting. It does really, really help. Okay. So I, I kind of block out some basic ideas. I'm kind of using very similar variations of the same the same shade over here. 
one of the reasons I'm doing that is because it's great to have things coordinated really well on your painting. Always, always a good time when you can have things have a lot of relationship. So we always have this, this real internal need to kind of add an artificial amount of vibrancy by throwing a bunch of colors on the canvas, but you don't need to do that. You want to have these distinct decisions. You don't need to have variety on your canvas. You also have to have a bunch of unity on your canvas. And that's the important part, unity with variety. So reusing the same color over and over again, not completely to wash out the entire drawing, but just reusing it to the point where we have some idea of reuse, really important. So I want to see that same notion all over the canvas. I want to see that same color somewhere used over the canvas, here and there. If I don't, things become a little bit more muddy, a little bit more scattered, and just don't have the same impact as they should, because a drawing is not reality, right? It's much more simplified than reality. It's a simple, strong statement, and having your color space occupy so very of a distance between every single like, space in your, on your image, it's going to be a little bit affronting to the view, and you want to kind of avoid that a bit more. So again, keep a little bit of an eye on your color space. Don't go crazy with it, right? You want to have unity and you want to have variety. So when there's an opportunity, a similar edge, a similar area that's affected by a similar light, and this happens all the time because a lot of things are have some amount of symmetry to them, a lot of things that are angled in a similar way. So with that in mind, when you have those things that are in that, you know, that follow that description, when you have those kind of things happen in your painting, it's worth the, the, the consideration internally for us to think about the fact that, okay, well, can I indeed, can I indeed use the same color in that area? And most of the time, you can probably get away with it. You can probably get away with that idea. Really important to think about. Big consideration. Grab a deep red here. Really sell. I don't need. So I'm making these very distinct kind of strokes while I'm working. Done because again, it's mostly how Ala Prima is painted traditionally. So I want to kind of emulate that with my strokes here because I want to have a lot of like a lot of tooth revealed at the edge of each stroke. It doesn't matter. I'm gonna read. Really gonna have the read the painting. So I'm not kind of doing stuff like you would usually expect. A lot of paintings like this to happen, especially digitally, where I'm I'm not going through layers and layers and layers. I'm just building it up as it probably would have been built up uh, traditionally, and that's totally the, the point. Because how do you get a traditional look without you know following a traditional process? It's a bit difficult, so why not just follow the process and see if you can maybe grab a couple of things from it, right? Canvas, welcome, welcome back to you. Just eating, dude. I could, I could use with some food right now. I could really use a little bit of food. I think uh, this pasta downstairs. Grab myself a little bit of that here today. So just structuring some light and some darks. I'm not strictly residing towards the idea of I want to go from light to dark because since this is digital and I can I have the, the liberty of like having a couple of tries at this, it's fine for me to just go a little bit helter skelter. But if you want to stick strictly to what the artist has suggested, then in that in that mind it might benefit us a little better to um, go from dark to light but I've never liked to work that particular way that's my personal interest and in fact even on his patreon he's mentioned the idea that you know this is a personal choice by the artist that's fine really important that once you make a strong statement in one area remember and try to remember as much as you can how much is going to impact other areas like when I make this stroke over here on the side of the face that's the um, stroke that represents natural cartilage of the nose. This actually has a lasting consequence towards most of the piece because I can see the same value, at least hints of it, in so many different areas, right? You can see hints of this value, yeah, for example, over here, in the cheek, right over there. You can see hints of this value over here, right underneath the shadow of the mouth, right? Underneath the maw of the mouth, in the chin, on the jaw. This is painted and uploaded by a scanner. I woke up multiple hunger groans from my stomach, took two bites, took two bites of the sandwich and I'm full. I'm gonna eat more canvas. I'm gonna put some meat in those bones. How are we gonna impress all those cute Korean hentai artists on Twitch? You're on swole as fuck. Come on, man. Step it up.
No man, I have a weak appetite. Yeah, I, I, I sort of feel you. I'm a former fat, fat kid though, so I don't feel you all that much, but I can relate to the idea. Just building up things slowly but surely. Always making general assessments. But the most important thing at this point that we gotta remember is that, if at all, we have the option to make a decision that's roughly close to what I want, I will most likely make the decision for myself on the canvas. The reason being is that it's, it's, it, I'm much more value the idea of covering everything with paint than get, getting everything right at the very beginning. Because getting everything right from the beginning is a much more difficult thing to do compared to just getting things vaguely right. Because when you get things vaguely right on the canvas, it's very valuable because it establishes a good amount of context on your canvas. And it's easier to make good decisions on your painting if you have good context on it. Right? Much harder to kind of make this assumption when you have barely nothing, barely anything on your canvas. So you really got to be really careful with this kind of idea. So don't, don't ever be afraid of just kind of making your best assumption, your best judgment in certain areas, and then just moving on. So you can always make a correction later on, a very good, very decent correction. But if you're trying to make a correction with everything that you do, you're going to bleed a bunch of time. And it will cost you in the pain. It will indeed cost you. So be a little bit careful. So make your best guess. The way that I personally always see it is that you should have 100% confidence in yourself before you make a stroke. And then after that, you can be as critical as you want. Be very critical after you make that stroke. But otherwise, you'll just be stuck. You'll be stuck second guessing and third guessing yourself. It's always going to have an impact on the piece. Good pieces are confident. Have a very confident idea of what you're doing. You know, one, that, one that resonates with your work. Arse plunge. Thanks for the follow, man. Don't know why my alerts are not working, but I guess I can just read them out. It also really benefits us to kind of know what to expect, right? So where does light actually occur? Where does the shadow occur? And all of this comes from understanding structure of the face. And structure is a very long thing. I'm still learning structure. and I've been doing this consistently for a long time. So knowing exactly how the structure is going to relate to the light will really reveal or really make your whole job as an artist a lot easier because when it comes down to kind of getting good good areas of value good good shapes in general understanding structure is going to really stream on that idea because ultimately the structure the, the physical structure of something the topography of something is going to dictate just how well those two two-dimensional shapes are going to be in order to depict this three-dimensional form right it's going to really strongly help you so knowing structure is immensely important. It's the idea that, sure, you can always use a reference, and you can tell yourself, okay, well, I, I can just copy the reference as best as I can, and it helped me, and you're not wrong, it does help a lot. But knowing what to look for, the expectation over observation is so, so powerful, and should not be underestimated. A very, very powerful thing. Kind of knowing what to expect. That's what they call a trained eye, you know? When they say train your eye to look for certain things, that's really what they mean. So it's not just you, you're looking for things really, really uh, particularly, but you sort of know what to expect. And that's really important. That's really, really important to understand. So the more you sort of draw certain things, the more you realize that, okay, well, they usually follow a particular pattern. So when you are, when it's down to you to try and draw that particular thing, you have an idea in your mind, you have a game plan already in mind. And that makes your stroke so much more efficient. You're not floundering in this ocean of nothingness anymore. You really know what you want to do. Let's save this before we lose everything to the annals of time. Okay. I want to mix a color that's ever so slightly warmer than... No, maybe not warmer, a bit more yellow than that, and a bit lighter to depict the nose right there. Ah, how pretty is that color? A bit more red there. So... Okay, I'm finally here. That's a good shrimp. A bit more desat than that. Let's just get rid of that stroke really quickly. I don't want to like, do like 50 different passes and things. I'm going to do one stroke right there, make an adjustment, do my second stroke, test. I think that's okay for the time being. Good enough. I zero confidence is showing back in PS. When I first started that portrait, my hands were shaking from the nerves. I felt like I went from an old pickup truck to a Tesla in terms of software. Hey, don't worry about it. Do you get, I mean, your fundamentals are strong, Canvas. You're going to be okay. Just pick like really small, simple stuff. Just get used to the software again and you'll be, you'll be high ceiling. Like every every now and then when I when you know when I'm working, I will I will be in this particular like mindset for so long that when I come to something completely different, I feel myself so lost. But what I usually do at that point is I just I take a couple of seconds to really simplify my, my approach, my my topic of study, and just give myself a little bit of time to breathe, get comfortable first, and then just back to it. Simple as that.
Block by block. Thanks for the uh, for the host, man. I do appreciate that. How's it going? Is it going to be your final study? Or are you going to do some more? This is going to be my final study for today. And then I'm going to do some painting. I'm probably going to be painting this subject over here in the same style. But yeah, keep it simple, Canvas. You know the whole Anthony Jones thing? When he says that if you don't understand something, just get rid of it. That kind of idea. Maybe not as severe as that, but like if you're uncomfortable with things right now, let's just like not force ourselves to kind of stomach every little inch of that um, uncomfortableness or that discomfort. You know, kind of let yourself easily kind of glide back into it. You know, give yourself some room to kind of heal. Otherwise, it might be a little bit you know, too much to ask of yourself. Be reasonable with your requirements. Yeah, but this is indeed going to be the final study, and then we're going to do a painting. But you're welcome to join us in the painting phase of this. But like I said about structure, man, really important to understand like why certain things are happening. Because that'll let you be able to pick and choose exactly where you want to add these shapes, how you want to design your shapes. It doesn't really matter. Like, shall we go into a little bit more detail on that kind of idea? So let's look at the eye, for instance. So what is the construction of an eye? And there's so many ways you can think about the eye in general. But what is the basic kind of components that make up an eye? Well, structurally, it's something like this, right? Think about it in a very planar fashion. So what a plane is, it's an oriented surface, basically. So think about a cube. A cube has well, how many sides? Six. So essentially what we're thinking about here is just where the surfaces are pointed. Because if you know where something is pointed, you can somewhat kind of determine how the light is going to react to it, or how it's going to react to light, rather. So for an eye, you can think about the eye as three, not oh, a new layer for this. Now it's like this, right? We have one, two, three. Simple planes to depict the top lid. We can get, go even simpler than that. Let's draw the ball of the eye first, the eyeball right there. It's a ball of the eye. So we have an eyeball easily. Uh, we, we know this and we know there are lids on top of it. So what do the lids look like? You're gonna have again one, two, three right there. It's gonna be your top lid. And you have, generally speaking, in, in most simplifications, you have one and then two for your bottom lid and it goes into the tear duct right over there. Simple as that. So exactly what am I getting from this information here? I'm getting the fact that over here, overall eyelid here, like this in three dimensions, I get a lot of information from this whole idea. Because what this is saying is that this over here, that is a left-facing plane, that over there is a right-facing plane, and this over here is a center-facing plane. And that's invaluable to know because we know what side all of these different components are facing, essentially, right? So what that means is that when light comes from the right-hand side or from the left-hand side over there, it means that certain areas are going to get lit and certain areas are not going to get lit, depending on how they're oriented. This is a left-facing plane, so it's going to get the light, right? This is a front-facing plane, turning away from the left, so we'll get some light, but not nearly as much as the light that I got from the, from the right. I'm oh, sorry, from the, uh, from the left plane right there. Not nearly as much. And this is a right-facing plane, so it goes into the dark. This is a very, very simple kind of breakdown of how you, how you can start thinking structurally. So we know where surfaces are oriented. Same thing on the other side, right? Left facing plane. So I expect there to be a bit of light right there. Right facing plane. We can just simplify it as dark. That. And then slowly, slowly but slowly, we start to build up an understanding of what we're looking at. And remember, everything in everything in reality, everything that we see in artwork, it is composed of some amounts of, of plane, some amount of shape. It's always there. So the more you think about it, the more structure you're actually going to see, the more you know, efficient strokes are going to be. Because ultimately, what is the shape in this whole idea? Where's the shape? So I know what the planes is, where the planes are. So I can start to determine better shapes with it. I can kind of draw the shape out to be a bit more evocative, maybe a bit more curved right there. Right? I can design the shape. Maybe I'll remove this, this little area over there. Maybe I can design the shape to be like this, a bit more interesting of a shape. Right? You know, I get to design what this looks like within the confines of this two-dimensional plane arrangement we had. Right? So using, using what I had, the knowledge that I had from those, from those planes, I kind of get information about my shape design. So my shapes need to evoke my planes because my planes are what tell me where my surface is pointed, and the shape is supposed to tell me a two-dimensional idea of how that shape reacts to light. That's how it works. That's the, how everything is connected to each other. And remember, everything in the idea, even the side, so we can say that the, the ball of the eye over here is also, it's a spherical shape, right? So it's going to get light on this side, it's going to get dark on this side. That's exactly what we see in reality, right? Even the brow over here, right? Even the brow, we expect the brow of the light, right? The other side of the brow to have some light over there, some dark where it goes near the center of the, um, the eyes, the glabella right there. Probably going to have a 
medium one lighter over there, then we're going to be really light on the other side. And we can expect this to happen in reality. And if you know enough about the planes of your subject, if you know enough about what, what you're looking at, you're eventually going to get really, really structurally accurate looking drawing. That's what we're trying to do here. So, what the artist is thinking about. A last bit of information about that whole tangent, about shape planes and their relationship. It's worth looking at simplifications and constructions and also help you with this idea. So now that we know the importance of shapes and with planes, how do you know what the shapes and planes are? So in that regard, it's great to look at simplifications and construction methods. Construction methods can be something like Loomis method or Riley method or that. It can also be looking at simplified versions of what you're looking at. So in that respect, the Asaro head is a great example of a simplified version. So it's what I use personally. And it's like a very, very simple version of the head. So you see, literally just what I described. Because I did all of my simplification. Sorry. The one, two, three right there. The oriented one, two, three surface. Very simplified idea. Because now look at this over here. Compared to what we're looking at in the painting. All right, let me play it for you so it's a bit closer. So we start to see a lot of the same. Really, that's the point of... of um, Filtering a reference, right? Filtering reality. Because this is a painting, so an artist has filtered reality to paint this. You see, it's, it's a lot of that same idea. That simple statement, with a little bit of detail on top, a little bit of complication. So it's a beautiful painting. That's the idea. Very achievable, right? Then you kind of break it down that simply. What is the source of this image? This image over here? That's John, Lar that's John Lariva's, um, I think, The Claw, it's called. Something like that. The Asaro? That's from, <laughs> that's from my computer. It's part of one of the workshops I did with, uh, with Marco Bucci. Online uh, workshop about drawing the head. Asaro, by the way, with an S. But you can find a bunch of this, this even on the Discord. So join the Discord, by the way, if you're listening in and you want to get resources, join the Discord. Um, on the Discord, I've pinned in the resources section, I've pinned uh, a three-dimensional model a 3d model of this particular head uh, it's from sketchfab so look towards that and take screenshot of that head. there you go machiavelli it's a good practice Any? Alright, so let me delete the layer really quickly to save some RAM. We need to add in a very strong light from the bottom, then add a bit more red there. So I don't do too many corrections with my colors. Just a couple of statements right there for the for the chin right there. I'm gonna make my chins a bit too wide sometimes, so I'm obviously for that a little bit later in the in the But for now, uh, again, still need to cover everything with paint, that's the primary. Okay, pause because I need to Okay, we're good. So the, the idea is, is we want to cover the maximum amount of this painting with paint as soon as possible. That's what I'm uh, trying to get, get done right now. So in that respect, a bunch of simplification, you know, a bunch of just kind of vague notions in certain areas, but ultimately we end up with semblance of the painting. But let's keep doing that really quickly. And the lights and darks where they need to go. Again, all this is done with an idea that we just kind of bounced upon. The idea that we're thinking strongly about the structure. on there guys nice. also a little bit thing a little bit of an important note in this method is that you're gonna have to have a bit of disconnection especially when painting a little bit all the prima is that things are not gonna look great things are not always gonna look great especially even uh, recreating a reference and I've said this for both the other paintings that we did that we've done in the past because these these are like such messes but it's it's kind of good to kind of separate yourself out from that because Ultimately, when you're working for speed, you don't want to waste or bleed time to try and make things look pretty at every stage. It's going to not really benefit you. But it's kind of worth just thinking about that. Thinking, okay, well, what do we already care about here? Because ultimately, a lot of the beautification stuff that we're going to work towards to try and like regain some sort of appeal at every stage of a work, it doesn't really feature into the final work sometimes. And it can very well overwork your painting sometimes. 
something that's worth just looking out for. Anyway, just think about this structurally. There's going to be a front-facing plane right over there. Remember, we just talked about front-facing planes. The front-facing plane right over there in the front of the nose right there. Maybe a bit more red in there. There, easy enough. And we've got to update a few values here. That is a natural cartilage right there. Uh, when you're doing a master study like this, are you taking consideration the brush stroke angles? To a certain degree, yes. I am trying to figure out how they construct the things, but it's not like my primary focus for this. It's very much more about the approach of stuff. Because I, I don't doubt that a lot of the initial strokes that I've done were a little bit different than his. So it's not like completely my primary goal to get to match a stroke, stroke for stroke. But more of just the general effect of the paint. What I'm like looking for. Just the impression it kind of leaves me with. So if I get that right, I consider it. Again, the whole notion of reuse here. Using that value from the eyebrow, I'm sorry, from the top of the eye. Updating the value of the cheek right there. Slowly but surely, getting to that conclusion. We can slightly begin to kind of think about the silhouette a bit on this face. Paint in a little bit more. Gonna lower that profile a bit more. And also, I won't make the same mistake I did yesterday. I kept, I kept kind of beating away at this edge with a hard brush. I think for this one, I'll, I'll just soften it up to begin with. With a bit of a lost edge right over there. This lost edge I think is going to be... Hmm. Let's just start right there, most likely. The dark blue that's, that's making up the shadow to begin with. And I'll add the strokes in later on. This is more of a digital way of doing it, I think. But I was having a bit of an issue with the way the brush was programmed. I'm trying to get this edge the last time I, I, I painted something for this artist. So for this time, I'm just going to manually soften that edge up myself. And then after that, I'm add in the strokes a little bit. But, Digital effect that was lost. I'm sorry, the, the traditional effect that was lost by doing it. Okay. Just a bit of an experience kind of thing right there, just knowing what uh, what I've done in the past. It was a bit difficult for me to get that exact kind of softness. And you know, granted, it's still not very exact to begin with, but it's it's already soft, so I can start building up a little bit of tooth on there, as opposed to before where I was struggling to make it as soft as I really so Again, just something that I've learned from the previous studies. Brush right there. I want this brush. Easy enough. Make a general assessment. Every time, every time I paint something like this, whether I'm painting, every every few minutes I'll zoom all the way out and kind of blur my eyes and see exactly where I'm at in the painting, so I can start to make some really bold corrections if uh, I need to. And oftentimes I do need to, right? Because things need to be nimble on the canvas. Always be ready and prepared to make changes. I think that's a worthwhile thing of thinking about, right? Because even when I watch speed paintings by elite artists, right? People that are really so much insanely better than we are. And I use the word better quite strongly. But even when I watch videos like that, sure they make less mistakes than we do, because they know a lot more about what they're doing. But when they do make a mistake, they're really, really swift and very definitive to correct that mistake. And I think there's a lot to be learned from that. Because I, I oftentimes personally find this, find this problem where I feel a way too invested in my painting wherein I don't want to make the change because I think it looks okay the way that it is and I feel like I want to retain my work a little bit but of course it's like it's you can't just settle on your painting you can't just settle for something that looks just okay you want it to look the best it can in that way kind of training yourself to be much more open to the idea of making these large changes really quickly really nimbly very powerful thing to think about very worthwhile trying to explore how quickly you can make those changes Be nimble on the canvas. So for example, when I make changes with proportion, like really big ones, I'll just grab areas, I'll make huge strokes, and that's entirely by it's entirely intentional, right? So I really need it to be that way. Because I know this with my history of painting that I am so so scared of making those kind of things. That I even if I make them, they're not very impactful. So just knowing myself and doing all the work that I have and then taking shop gotta avoid the stuff that you know you, you yourself are inclined to and the only way you'll know what your inclinations are if you do the work yourself and if you kind of know yourself and you've done so much stuff with yourself so well that's got came on wrong 
done so many studies by yourself, really, really focusing on what you're uh, getting right and wrong. You're gonna figure out that, okay, this is what I do. This is my mistakes, this is my inclinations, and my... And it helps a lot, knowing what your, what your stumbling points are. That is very, very important stuff. Okay, so the nodes of the mouth right there, usually quite soft, edges of the lip, so it's worth thinking about. So usually when all this painting is done quite harshly, but when I go to this area over here, I'm going to think about slightly thinking about more circular kind of shapes in general. Giving it a bit more form. And like I said before, those areas of occlusion we talked about on the crit of today, earlier today, the racial Bradley crit, same idea applies here because you have a little a little mass on the side of the mouth right there. So it walk into a form, really add a bunch of life to your painting. The fact that it's so, it's so out there, you know, it's so um, structural. Good. I believe um, traditional artists call that massing it in, I think. You mask that area in. It's a fun thing to look at. All right, let's add in that light for the chin. It's going to be quite harsh. This artist, in his personal style, has a habit of whenever he has this high, high amount of light in an area, It'll also reflect that high amount of light with very very sharp edges just to really emphasize the fact that indeed it is a very very harsh light and I like that it's a really cool thing to do stylistically i don't know if i'll incorporate it myself but it's a neat thing by the artist a neat decision by the artist a completely intentional one i think it looks awesome i know it's intentional by the way because he has work that he has not done this just to experiment with it but i, I do really like how it looks definitely a big Time to get there, right? We're building upon some colors. Some of the areas are being addressed with um, with some version of their final color, which is starting to look pretty decent. Slowly, slowly building this up. By making these singular strokes, again, a little bit different than what we used to when we're painting digitally. So what we're used to doing half the time with these kind of works is that we always try at every single point to kind of layer things in a much more systematic way. And there's a lot of benefit to that because you realize that a lot of these artists that work that way, they kind of, most of them kind of learn from these really like deadline based like anime manga cell shading kind of artists that work in studios so their workflow was really designed to get you know a very achievable very good result in as little time as possible if you like so they use the power of the digital tools to get there but ala prima this whole method of painting it also kind of came from a similar origin where people just hated the idea of like waiting for things to dry and just spending a whole amount of time you know, just, just tinkering, tinkering, uh, I'm sorry, tinkering away at a particular subject. Just wanted to get a very strong evocation of the subject very quickly. That's what, like, maverick a la prima painters like Carolus Duran. So that's, that's his name, Carolus Duran, the person that taught uh, Singer Sargent. That's why artists like that were kind of renowned. Style was first time to get developed, I believe. And yeah, like the stories they say about Duran were insane. How quickly he could fix a painting, just how fast he could take something from being just a, a regular old study to being a real work of museum quality art and when we think about like traditional painting we think oh it's a slow steady process you wait for it to dry really these artists that, that did paintings like this and continue to do paintings like this i don't think this painting that we're studying right now took more than like two or three hours so it really tells us a lot about just how varied it is it's how crazy this whole art uh, industry can be it's like it's like how craig mullins talks about this all the time he says you know in art in general and i think in most skills for every example there's usually a counter example so when you have this idea that art's supposed to be this very systematic you know long drawn out casual process that requires a lot of immense intricate thought it's not wrong right because there's so much of art that does require that and it's not like art like this is quick it, it, it certainly is quick but it's not like it doesn't require thought but really, that's not all art. It's very hard to kind of define it that way. Really, what happens is there's so many ways, there's so many ways of like achieving this. So many things that we can do. So many factors we can manipulate to get a, a resulting image. And that's, there's a certain beauty in that. If you don't like something, if you see something that you see everywhere in most people's artwork, and you don't like that, there's a good, decent chance that in if you explore, you know what's possible, what's out there. You will find an artist that is successful doing things that you personally want to do but are afraid to. Which is awesome. I really like that idea. I'm, I'm feeling with the stroke here while I talk. But that's a really cool idea to me. Because 
when I started learning all those years ago, I was like, okay, if I need to learn how to paint, I want to always be able to sit down, you know, and you know, draw and render an eye for 15 hours. And I didn't, I didn't like that idea, but I did it because I thought I had to. But you don't have to. Which is why I always suggest that when people first start painting and you're looking for like mentors or you're looking for inspiration, pick people who you are envious of, pick people who you are really inspired by. Don't pick people that everybody likes. Because what happens? What, what about you in that in that picture? Ultimately, you're the one that's going to be painting. What about you? That's a you're you're a valid participant in that whole transaction. You need to care about what you think, care about what your own tastes are. But with that respect. Think about what you personally like to do, what you really, really adore. Those people should be your idols. It shouldn't always be the same old, same old gauntlet of ours that everybody talks about. Because maybe you don't want to paint that way. It's totally okay. It may even benefit you for your wise, right? Because right now it seems like everybody can paint a certain way, right? Everybody can get that art station level rendering. Not everybody. I can't. <laughs> but uh, you know, after after a while, I'm assuming I would be able to. But. Then it becomes like, what's the presentation? What's like the the feel of your artwork, right? How good is your ability to tell a story? How good are your stories? How good are your ideas? Maybe that other track will give you better ideas than me, and you should probably get a job that I won't get. Yeah, I feel like it's a read thing. It's a good thing to think about. But as much as I do preach like realism and all that stuff, I, I think I understand, and I've seen so many examples of artists that don't do things exactly the way that I do. Are very successful at it. We're talking about because ultimately, what do we care about here? We don't care about trying to espouse the virtues of painting realistically or with speed. We care about the idea of you know doing what you like, improving on it, pursuing whatever it is that you are personally completely enraptured by, better at it. That's what we that's what we truly are after here. It doesn't make any sense for me to say realism, realism, realism. It's more about you know what do you want? What are you after? Yeah, about there, Glow. I would say not more than four hours. For, for all, all the premium stuff, it's really. I really suggest going to his Patreon, by the way. This dude has a Patreon. Go support him. It's uh, Lariva Art or John Lariva on Patreon. Please go look at his work. Fantastic. And he has a bunch of process stuff on his Patreon. Really worth looking at. A bunch of breakdowns about why he uses certain colors. And a lot, a lot of the information brought to you on the stream comes from my own conclusions looking at his work on his Patreon. Go check him out. I've been drawing, trying to draw for four hours a day and it's hard. So it's something that you got to build up to, right? So eventually you will be drawing for four hours a day, but it's not something you can just go from like cold turkey all the way to, to where you want to be. I think you got to build that up. You got to build that up ever so slowly. Is the body I feel like most people are like me in which in which you're like very very inertial with the decision making right it's like you, you're not used to doing the things that you, you can do but it's difficult to kind of break out so the only way you can really change something a lot about yourself the only way you can make a really significant personality change or workflow change or ethic change is very slowly very incrementally so don't just jump from like I'm assuming you were doing a lot less before and now you've made the commitment you say I want to learn I want to get better and people say you need to draw a lot, so I'm going to draw a lot. I'm assuming that's what happened. But take it easy. You no, know? ease yourself into it. Simple, achievable goals. That's what I preach. Because I, I paint a lot of, a lot of the day. I paint between like six to ten hours every single day, and, and that's really active painting. Right, just sitting there and thinking. But when I first started, I didn't paint for more than forty minutes a day. But I was always trying to push the boundary of what was possible. I think that's just the key to it. I think that's the key to it. You do just more than you think you can do. Just more. Not crazy amount more. Right? Because that's how you make a sustainable change in your life, right? For anything, not just painting. So be it like exercise or weight loss or whatever. You know, when you wanna be when you wanna make a consistent life change, you can't make things like crazy, crazy, like immensely stark. Of a, di of a difference, it's difficult. But you keep things more reasonable with yourself, be nice and gradual, ease into it, you'll be surprised. Because you don't ever want to burn out, you know? You don't ever want to burn out. Because especially in art, I think all of us know people that have painted you know, along with us at some point or the other. 
don't paint anymore. Did it a little bit more, little, little bit less sustainably than they should have. Burnt out and it's bad taste in their mouth now. They don't do it. It's worth remembering that when you are doing this, when you're on this journey, you're in this for the long run. In this for the long game. Okay? Which means that you want to do the you want to make decisions for yourself that are the most sustainable. In that respect, make the long-term decision. Sure, you're not gonna be painting as much as people say you should right now. Decisions that you make that allow you to do that eventually, right? Be it a week, a month, a year, right? But it will get you there. So take the, the sustainable route always. You know, that's why people recommend don't don't follow these uh these insane lose 10 kilograms in a in a month fat diets, right? These fat detox diets. Why do they say that? Well, they say that because you might lose the weight, sure, but it's so ridiculously unsustainable, the things that you have to do to do that, that you probably put that weight back on directly. Right? You just immediately put that weight back on. And it was all pointless. Owe it to yourself to just be a little bit more long-term minded, right? How to balance education, art, and work out? I balance the same thing, man. It's possible. Trust me, it is. It requires sacrifice, right? But if you want to want to make it a thing, if you want to make all those things a thing, then you gotta slowly ease into it, slowly but surely get there. But it is possible, man. Look at uh, look at Noah Bradley, for example, right? We were looking at his wife earlier today. That's a really weird sentence to say. Uh, we we're looking at a painting of his wife earlier today, and that dude, he's fucking jacked, right? Dude's huge. Um, he's a teacher, professional artist, and he has time to do a bunch of studies in his day. So we know it's possible. So if it's possible for him, why is it not possible for us? Right? That's why I really admire people that are just so much better than us. You know, I, I'm so grateful that they exist. Which is a weird thing to say. It's like saying that I'm happy that I'm not good. That's not what I'm trying to say. Um, who? I catch Bradley? Oh, this dude. I picked the worst fucking brush for this. <laughs> there you go, that guy. No, oh, Bradley. Check out his Instagram. Really good, really good painter. He's uh, work for Magic the Gathering. Phenomenal, phenomenal. And he's yeah, yeah, yoked. Capital Y yoked. I wonder if I beat him on lifts. I'm actually very curious. Maybe I do. <laughs> really wondering. I don't know what he lives. Okay, let's not get too, too fucking animalistic primate bro territory in here. Alright. Beautiful work. So, multi-faceted as well. This character, background. His wife as well. His wife's also very, very talented. I've learned a lot from him. Like, he has a great video. If ever anybody in here is struggling with backgrounds, I always, I always try to mention this video because it helped me there's, there's very few times that you see something that really, really makes a market difference in your artwork. Usually it's a very incremental, slow thing, and you'll you'll realize this like the more you start learning formally, um, if anybody's not doing that already. Like it's it's very incremental. Like you're never gonna have a, a wow moment very often. There'll be like slow build-ups, slow understandings, right? There'll be plenty of those. But really there's not gonna be that many times in your in your learning that you say, Oh my goodness, I'm suddenly a better artist. But that video, that art camp video on YouTube to explain backgrounds, that was one of those kind of videos for me. When he explained the value breakdown and distancing for backgrounds, I, my mind was fucking blown. I had never had that kind of idea broken down to me. Like, and I was so, so helpful. And until this day, whenever people ask me, hey, James, how'd you do that background? I say, go watch that video and then come back to me. Because nothing I can say will, will be anywhere close to how helpful that video was. The three rectangles or blobs? I mean, sure, I guess you could call it that. It's like the fundamental, the principle there. Of uh, distancing of value, distancing of overlap with atmospheric um, perspective, all that kind of stuff. James, since artists post videos on YouTube, do you think there's any use in following it like a cooking recipe, following each step one by one? So, to a certain extent, yeah. So if you don't really know what you're looking at, it's kind of worth 
doing that. I've done that a couple of times for other artists that I really didn't know what was happening. Like people that do a different style. Because this guy, he paints Ella Prima and I have enough experience uh, studying people that paint Ella Prima that I know kind of what he's, he's going to do. Like I know the baseline. So it's easy for me to kind of say, okay, well he's doing this much and then this is what he does differently. So simpler for me. But um, like I've, looked, I've had to study some manga artists, some, um, uh, some artists like Vlop, for example. And people that do that hyper style shading kind of stuff, but I just, I'm just not used to doing that, you know? Uh, I'm just not doing that, so I'm not used to doing that. So in that case, for those particular works of art, I will slow down heavily. But for stroke for stroke, I don't think I'll ever do that because it seems a bit too non-sustainable for me. For yours, but it sometimes cuts you off. Uh, somebody clarify that, please, because there's a, there's a new noise gate filter. There's a new noise gate filter on my stream, and it might be cutting me off uh, a bit too much. So somebody clarify that, please. Is it indeed cutting me off? Because if it's uh, if that's so, then I need to change something about my noise gate. Right there. Nice jump. Just let me know. It does cut you off sometimes. Okay, so what that means is that I need to reduce the threshold. Pause my timer really quickly. I do sometimes tend to trail off while I'm talking, so I need to avoid that. Let me quickly change some audio settings. Okay, I think I, sh I may have fixed it. All right, let me know if it keeps happening. I've reduced the close threshold for it, so it should be a lot better now. Uh, it should really wait for me to finish my sentences, so hopefully it works. But do let me know, guys. Okay, continuing on with the painting, though. We have a couple of marks to make. Uh, I will actually try to address the overall silhouette in a second. Just trying to finish up some initial marks here. So highlight on there really quickly. And then we can go and address the overall silhouette because we've been we've been needing to do that for a little bit. I don't think I've been waiting too long in doing it. So we'll quickly do that really quickly. Get the little light on top of this area over here. It's called a filtrum. On top of the lips right there. Oh shit, thanks Nos. I just paused it. Don't call me out for cheating, right? It's technically your job to do the timer, all right? I'm paying you for. All right, so again, simplify whenever possible. These values go a bit more muddier, so grab maybe a bit more desaturated, darker value. Build the shape in. But really, once you get the essentials in there, it's a lot easier to kind of find your way through the painting. Once you're going to get those initial ideas. <laughs> You're paying, listen, all right? What do you want, the truth? All right, get a bit of green on here. A bit of the, the reflected light from the hair. Also right there. Yeah. I'll be the one saying hello to everyone. <laughs> like a stream greeter. God, let me tell you, when I... Whenever I visit America or something like that, and the people that are in the store, they, they greet me, I get so uncomfortable for some reason. I think it's just because I'm really anti- like, I think- I don't know if it's me that's anti-social or my country is, but that's just not something you do, you know? It's like I'm just- I mean, it's like the middle of the day or something, or it's like 4am in the morning. I don't want anybody to look at me, I'm wearing like a hoodie, like I haven't showered. Please don't talk to me. Please don't talk to me, I'm, I'm already embarrassed as it is. All right. Get in there. A lot of really interesting strokes in this painting already. So the method really does does shine. 4 a.m. in the morning. Listen. 
You're surprised cops stop you? Why, why do you want to? Why gotta bring that up? All right, I'm gonna bring up that stuff. Hello? I bring up your arrest record? No. Well, pay me some similar courtesy. There are some people sometimes. My goodness. All right, get in there. I do like some of the blue that's gonna bleed you through on some of these areas. All right, now it's about time that we think about refining the silhouette a bit more because we're approaching the one hour mark. And I would like to have a refined silhouette by one hour mark. So let's quickly do that. The nice thing about this, the really nice thing about this is that I already have a litany of existing good coordinate colors on my canvas already. So I can just start sampling from my existing color space and getting the colors that I need in all these areas, which is good. It saves me a bunch of time. Ensuring we have some sort of coordination here. It seems like the side of the jaw draw plumb down here and get about approximately what the side of the beautiful jacket she's wearing. You can approximately find that using this. And we can just use some nice deep throaty orange values right over there. Bring that into the four. There we go, that's sufficient. And then we extend that down using a nice little graceful shape to find the corner of the dress. Let's use that. Have to highlight the edge of the neck right there. The props are wrong when we have more stroke, it seems fine. I'm glad it seems fine now. Maybe we're just looking at different things, you know? Sometimes all I have in certain areas is just like notions of what things need to be, but not necessarily because. Uh, the way I'm painting this is that I'm not paying too much of a mind towards outside silhouettes, so it gives me room to do some stuff like this where I cut into the uh, the form a bit more. So I'm just thinking on the long game, so why correct something if I'm going to paint over it anyway? So in that in that respect, not necessarily like something you have to do. But once you get comfortable with like just getting roughly okay proportions with your artwork, it's, it'll take you some time. That's all that this is. Deep throaty is not a value of orange. No, I swear to God, it's like abs as your account sometimes. It's like a very abs comment right there. <laughs> Actually, I can push your glasses up more, you nerd. All right. Don't compare me to that. <laughs> and stop sounding like it. <laughs> that was hurt. <laughs> that was fighting words. All right, getting some real estate on the uh, on the jaw here. You don't even know. Oh, do you not like abs? Is that drama on my stream? I don't believe it. It's supposed to be a drama-free environment. No. Um, all right, let's quickly kind of solve some issues here with proportion. I'm gonna have to make a bold statement here. Like I said, we like making bold statements in my stream. Like I said, we don't like using modification, uh, like for example, liquefaction stuff, like liquefy or whatever. So in that respect, it's kind of important for me to just get a really harsh kind of read here, get that negative space where it needs to go, and then paint accordingly. The whole Andrew Tischler philosophy of correcting uh, mistakes in your painting. Go hard or go home, basically. Don't make some like a little change and be satisfied with it, because it's what everybody does. It really is what everybody does. I encourage you to look at your own work. In the past, most of the time, we are okay with evaluating whether or not a change needs to be made, but the change itself is usually heavily, heavily low-balled. Worth considering that fact. I'm gonna change his name, color, username, and move his family with new social security. I can't be here anymore. No, I'm sorry. Awesome, sorry, please come back. Please. Alright. Make the correction right over there. I'm gonna have to find this final value for the hair, shouldn't I? At some point I'm gonna arrive at this conclusion here. Let's just let's just toss some things around like a chimp and then hopefully something sticks. Uh yeah, that sticks. Okay. Uh something like that maybe. 
a bit lighter. Like I said, my, my whole statue when it comes to picking colors is you make your best guess with value and then make your best guess with, with uh, temperature. So I, I have my best guess for value right now. This is a question to find that temperature. Unfortunately, the brush that I'm using has some weird internal like calculation that kind of messes up the, the true color. So sometimes I might have the right color and it doesn't show up properly. But I'm just keeping that in mind. Can you please be saturated? Thank you. Yeah, good enough. Okay, gonna make some big... I was about to say big... F I didn't even say it. Those are big flappy strokes, but it doesn't make any sense. I don't want to be called out again. My pride's been hurt already too much. Some big flappy strokes on there to the top. And I can fix the outside silhouette. I can prevent her from having that giant humor on the side of her head. Flappy is not better than flappy? Of course it is. <laughs> it's better for me. <laughs> All right, it's some slightly interpolated values here to go lower. I think about slight amount of desaturation, heading away from the focal point and all that. I want to keep my saturated colors near my focal point. That's what the artist is doing, by the way. I feel like I'm, I'm like narrating this as if I know what I'm doing. It's like this is what the artist is doing, by the way. Anybody's curious. We're gonna have to do some cropping as well eventually. We're at the one hour mark. Okay, nice, solid changes. Did we use a bit of that, that weird blurry brush before? Okay, if I'm gonna use that blurry brush right now, the smudge brush, I will leave some raw material here so I can work with it. I love that slideshow effect on your brush. Really alternative, that slideshow effect. Thanks man, I've been working on it. I remember back in school, people didn't even have graphics cards yet because, you know, caveman society. But I remember somebody got GTA San Andreas from like a friend of a friend who lived in Dubai or something. And we played it on a computer that had no graphics card. And it was like playing a, a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation. But it, we had so much fun still. This goes to show how crazy the times were. What's weird is that Need for Speed Most Wanted at the time I ran without a graphics card. It was fine. And Andreas though. Also, I remember thinking I came home to my family that day because it wasn't in my house; it was in my like my rich friend's house. Um, and I said, "That's the realest game I've ever played. The graphics were like real life." And you go back and you see like San Andreas speedruns, and like people are made of like five polygons at most, and you're like, "What the hell were you smoking?" Most wanted San Andreas, Halo, Halo CE, Halo CE, really? For um, for me, it was Counter Strike 1.6. That's what everybody played in school. That and they're like these ultra nerdy kids that played Dota, but everybody hated them. So nobody. Just a bit more of a blue. From friend, not, not, that's not even joking. It's like exactly what happened. Glenn. Like I'm, I wish I made that shit up, but I didn't. That was that wasn't nostalgia. People still play that right now. CS 1.6 is more preferred sometimes. Is it really? I don't, I don't tend to know too much about that. Information. I'm gonna throw some raw material in here again because some of this is gonna get blurred. I actually kind of dig the textures in the hair right now. They kind of look pretty cool to me, but uh, we'll we'll attempt. Just a just a sprig, you know, just a just a smidge of um, or two or or defocus tool. Let's see what it looks like for personal experimentation sake. Also, I want to really resolve this shadow shape on the side of the face. It's kind of bothering me. We're missing one value there and a bit of edge work. But we'll get there. Where did this stroke come from? Did anybody see? Did anybody catch the number plate in the stroke? Jesus Christ, there's another one here as well. Coming out of nowhere. 
getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. We desat towards the edges. Again, maintaining a nice even color space right there. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Eagle eyed John, they call him. Okay, I have this weird wiggly wimey brush over here, but I'm gonna use it for a little a few of these strokes. Uh, this kind of hurts a little bit, honestly, but I'm losing so much tooth, and I, I love the tooth with most of this artwork, but I, that's, I just need to do it, right? Otherwise, it's hard to get the look. Go. Go, I have no idea if this is an improvement. I'll have to check once I'm done. What's it, chat? Give me an outside perspective on these strokes. What's the conclusion? Yay or nay? That blue is so gorgeous, man. His colors are insane. It's just so appealing, this combination. I would never in a, Okay, I'm not gonna say in a million years, but it's just so beautiful. How to tell? Let me get rid of it. Okay, it's definitely helping. Alright, a couple strokes in there. I'm gonna get rid of this weird like patch of mushrooms in her head for some reason that's there from my initial strokes. I guess I didn't block things in properly, but whatever. Just paint that nice and harshly, get rid of it. Hmm, don't like how that looks. Well, there you, go. <laughs> you guys ever ask questions and then don't wait for the answer? Just go on with your day? Alright. More strokes in there. The strokes make paintings. And, uh, yeah. It was a joke there, but, you know, I'm, I'm a big boy and I'm gonna make it. There. Okie doke. Uh, I'm gonna slightly rotate this shit because... Hey, what's happening here? Why is there a new layer on my piece? Okay, I'm gonna rotate everything a little bit. My goodness, what is happening with this overall canvas? What you, what you don't see behind the scenes, it's ridiculous. Okay, one hour seven, into the painting. Let's address this whole issue with the right cheek here, because I think Operation Don't Use a Brush, Use a Airbrush or something for the for the edge, didn't really end up too well. I feel like we could have done better by, uh, by this reference. You know what's a little bit uh, frustrating with my workflow? Is I have this thing, I have a, a hotkey on my tablet that's set to the scroll, and it keeps defaulting back to it sometimes when I restart my computer. So every time I kind of brush my hand across it, it undoes like five strokes, and I, I, I'm just stuck here wondering. It's a bit concerning. Maybe I should think about how to set that permanently in a certain way. But it's fine. It's not a big deal. It's not like I can't do the strokes again, right? I agree, though. Keep things nice and simple, nice and coordinated. Use the same blue from before. The right wanted to say, the layer studies are amazing. Dude, cheers, man. Thank you. Thank you, Kuriyami, right there. Go follow Kuriyami. He does this in real life. He does this in hardcore mode. I'm in Guitar Hero. He's on the stage. Killing it. Go check him out. Pretty good artist. Rated Peppo yesterday. Thinking about you. He may have gotten the raid, but he always had my heart. Um, alright. Just kind of thinking about a couple of these strokes over here. I think the VR, VR art? VR art. Uh, like, tilt brush, you mean? No tilt brush. I'll be adding some of these values here. Uh, not quite, I don't think. The shape. I need to go lighter, a bit more redder. I have the local values somewhat set properly, but a little bit of a notion towards these uh, temperatures. 
Lately, I've been struggling to find references I like to paint, so I think I'll also do some Mario studies. Hell yeah, get in on this, man. I'd love to see your interpretation of it. All for it. Since I'm maybe a little bit ahead of schedule on this painting, maybe I'll, I'll make an effort to kind of get some finalized values, because like I said, the arrangement of values is why we did the underpainting. But now that we've arrived at like a suitable like relative positioning for most of these values, we can start to really kind of refine things. So get those final edges in there, get those final like value statements in there. It's it's uh, now it's about the time that we could maybe consider doing this. But like I said, when you when you paint in this kind of method, there are a lot of stepping off points that you can uh, that you can have in the painting where you can say, you know what, I'm I'm done with this painting. There are a lot of those points that kind of occurs. Don't get me wrong with the stopping as well. Again, consider the value shift goes a little bit. Tinker. I think that stroke over there was from the uh, from the base right there. It's from the base coat, the, base. the underpainting. I mean, let's grab the color really quickly. I wonder how beneficial it will be for these paintings to just think about having a palette just to keep the painting a little bit more coordinated. I feel like I do a good enough job with color reuse that the palettes aren't really required, but it would certainly be interesting just how. Uh, how much of a change you would have on the overall look of the painting if indeed I was strictly painting from certain uh, certain colors and values. What is that, John? What'd you like? Well, they have a kind of similar style, so I'm a big fan of Lariva and Lipke. Done quite a few Lipke studies, but only one or two Lariva. Really? Can you link the Lariva studies, please? I want to see. Always like your work on Instagram. Big fan of files in general. Yeah, or both. I don't mind. Pop the whole Instagram in here. Let's just have a go at it. Be a bit more concerned about exactly what I'm trying to portray over here because it's particularly. The, the shape of the nostril needs to be conveyed with these strokes, and it's not happening. So we'll break it down, since we do understand what the structure is. So there's going to be a shadow underneath. Right? To um, to show that the nose is curling under. That's that's just done with that stroke. It's going to be a transitioning stroke on the side, from the greater alar cartilage down to the wing of the nose. And that, needs, that requires a stroke, but not as strong as the highlight of the nose. That's that stroke over there. And I feel like that's sufficient almost. Maybe a little bit of a, um, you know, a little bit of a change on the shape over there, but I think overall, I think that helps the painting a bit more. It's on VR art. I'm not sure if it's still brush. All of its videos, its videos, it's kind of cool. It's it's still brush. Cool. Okay. Okay with that. Yeah, but VR VR painting certainly is it's interesting to watch. I'd say it's like really like super inspiring to me, but then that's not, that's not like a bad thing. Really not a bad thing for that to happen. Because ultimately, like you like what you like, right? Nobody can dictate preference or enjoyment. I just like what you like. And I feel like it's worth like remembering that as well. Because otherwise, it's difficult to kind of figure out exactly what you want to do with yourself. Doing some finalized finalization to this value on the nose over here. A strong statement. It's becoming obnoxiously strong. You know why? It's because we're missing a little bit of a transitionary value there. Because it's, it's the, the ball of the nose is very circular, so it goes from area of light to half tone to shadow uh, to the core shadow, and we just jumped into the core shadow. So it requires a little bit of a half tone right there for this to work out properly. And also, maybe even with a slightly softer edge as well. And just that helps. Pause this really quickly. Let's check out Koryami's link. My wait, hold on. Dreamlabs the rescue. Realized my dashboard wasn't open. Hey, pretty good, Koryami. Hell yeah. Nice stuff. I'm wondering how well the, your sergeant stuff's gonna translate into this as well. I know you've been doing that whole method for a while. 
Very nice. Still versus fun? You have VR, Nos? I always wanted to get like a VR thing. I used to play VR chat back in the day. That was really fun. But uh, I, used to, I used to go on VR chat and sing songs. I was not very good, but it was fun. Fun like having people listen and stuff. That was, I wasn't painting at that time, so I just wanted some way of kind of having some creative expression. It was enjoyable. I feel like that whole VR thing uh, was like everywhere for a while. Yeah, I, I, I kind of liked it. It was cool. And then everybody was on that GTRP game. That was also kind of cool because it kind of gives people a platform to really, like, I guess, be creative, right? Because it's like a framework that everybody has, but it's kind of really up to you to kind of decide how do you want to use that platform to, uh, to make good content, I guess. I don't have VR, but I use it at a friend's house. Okay, very cool. Friend, you say? Is that how it's pronounced? I've only seen it written. Unrelated, want to check out my new drawings? Yeah, yeah. In the chat. Always encouraging people to post. Because this, this whole, like, Lariva studies comes from somebody giving me their work on Discord, so. On somebody, it's, um. What's, it, what's your name on? On um, Twitch, I keep forgetting. I know your name on Discord. <laughs> like I don't know your name on Twitch. It's a uh, Kuro, Kuro on Discord. I don't know what it's on. It's Deadly Desire. Now I remember. X Deadly Desire on Twitch. Got it. Yeah. So he needed a crit on uh, Mariva, and I was just so like it's just a great subject that I just got so enamored and I really wanted to do it. I hope you've been enjoying the, the paint. You're getting, you're getting something from this. Oh, thank you, Machiavelli. Nice. <laughs> What's this? Dude, you've been killing it, man. I really like that new stuff. Yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna do fine digitally. The line looks good. Is anybody hungry for some pasta? I could really use some. Put some darkness in here. One thing I've noticed is that because of the, the particular qualities of the brushes that I've been using, is the entire effect of the painting, while when I'm painting it, of course, it'll look correct to me for the most part, but it's just a tad bit overall too soft because when I run a noise filter on all of this, it's um, it's gonna look a little bit better because some of the brush tips I'm using are overall a little bit too soft for it to really like show like the thick kind of paint on paint kind of effect. Uh, I'm aware of this and I've been trying to do modifications off this off stream to get a bit more of a toothy brush, but yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what happens. Maybe I can even share the brushes that I have at the end of that like, little modification. Great stream. Look forward to stopping by again, dude. Cheers, Arch Plunge. I do appreciate that. You have a good rest of your day. The value underneath the nose, a little bit too strong, don't you think? It's ruining that uh, overall structure. Remember that old adage that everybody always says? Notifications not working? Oh, you cheered! Thank you for the bits, man. I do appreciate that. Thanks, Glow, for mentioning that. Yeah, I don't know what's up with my, with my notifications, but like, it's, it's all over the place today. Cheers, dude. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the bits. That's very kind of you. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to miss it. Oh, you want moderator? I'll take it from Ab and I'll give it to you. I 
All right. I, I do love the way this looks, like already. It, it really appeals to me. Maybe because I'm just used to. I, I just like a mess. I think as a human being, I'm just a messy person. But it's so. It's there's something about it. You know, it's not even well done particularly. But for some reason, I just like looking at this way more than I would like looking at like a hyper polished piece of art. Again, that's preference, by the way. I always am uh, very careful about trying to like not knock people that do like a lot of a lot of beautiful work on long paintings. It's it's admirable. It's nothing like it. I have mad respect for it. But I want to be a little bit careful. I'm talking about preference here. Not having a billion dis disclaimers when I make a statement is sometimes boring to listen to, but it's gotta be it's gotta be considerate towards my fellow artists. Your site doesn't seem to be set up for the 10% bonus bits that I've seen on other streams. Uh, I'm not sure why. I will look into it. I'm not, I'm not quite sure why either. But thanks for telling me that's even a thing, because I certainly was not aware. Yeah, anyway, thanks for the for the bits in general. I appreciate it. Oh, fuck. I oh, Jesus! Done this. That, that alert was so loud. A tree man live. Welcome, man. Thank you for confirming that my alerts indeed do work. I think I fixed it by toggling it again. We're doing a study right now of John Lariva. Great, great Alapino painter. Really, really good stuff. He's attempting to, uh, to figure out some of the techniques that he's used in his painting. I'm about one hour and 17 minutes into this painting right now. And yeah, we're just trying to figure out, to get a couple of takeaways of what the artist wants to make a statement with, how he kind of filters reality. And I've done a couple of them already. There are two of them that we did both in two hours, and if you want to see some personal work, there. I know what I do personally. Can't believe you've done this. I've got to change that. So Paulie in the chat has given me um, for every alert James loses one year of his life. Seems like it sometimes. But the thing is, I'm I'm not I'm not a jittery person, but when I'm when I'm painting particularly, I'm so like into it that sometimes I just forget, you know. I just forget to uh, have balls. James is fifty-seven in human. What am I, a fucking dog? All right, just we're just modifying shapes right now. You'll see, I'm not I'm not trailing my mouse all the way here. I'm not going to pick any colors. I'm just going to restructure the things I already have existing on my canvas. And that's a really important lesson to learn. Because ultimately you want your paint to have this kind of simple statement element to it. You don't want to have this litany of like crazy, crazy variety of colors. You want to keep things kind of somewhat controlled. So in that manner, it's worth after a certain point in the painting to really ask yourself, do I need, do I need to add more to make this painting better? Or do I just need to restructure things in a better way? Do I need to improve my shapes? Do I need to rearrange values in a certain way? You know, do I need to just sort of just consider the overall variety and maybe simplify things even further? These are valid questions to ask yourself. Because ultimately, paintings are a bunch of really simple ideas and together they make this gestalt complex, you know, greater than some of its parts kind of thing. But it's not, a, it's not an easy decision to make, you know? But it's worth considering, always, always worth considering this idea of, is it enough? You know, have I done enough in terms of adding information? Maybe I just need to restructure information right now. And most of the time, especially for really sub like subtle su subject matter, like women, for example, if you're bad at drawing women, like I am, this is probably going to be one of the biggest things you're ever going to have to try and overcome with your work. The fact that we just put too much on there, then it's really, really hard. Really hard to kind of get back there. Guys, okay, so I'll tell you, bye. I'm doing quite fine. I'm doing some doing, doing some studying and painting earlier today on stream right now. I'm having some good time with my pals. How about you? Is that the Indian test? <laughs> All right. So I want to add a bit of a streak of red, just because of that subsurface sky kind of Subsurface is a beautiful, beautiful subject. Really, really worth. James had the pupils. She feels solace without him. I was gonna leave him there, but okay. <laughs> is that so? But uh, the subsurface is really, really important. The artist in question is. He has a lot of good information on his Patreon, and I'm not gonna just like give 
give the goose here. I'm not going to go word for word and tell you exactly what he said. But he has answered a few questions on there. And one of the questions that he got was to uh, somebody asked him, well, how do you achieve a good amount of vibrancy with your faces, right? And one of the things he talks about there, he talks about how subsurface can be a great way of adding additional kind of colors to your piece because you have this beautiful warmness that cuts through shadows. And it shouldn't be just you know, ignored. It's really important to kind of think about the fact that it is indeed present in the painting. Some others could be accent lights. People forget about that. And this is a big subject of art that sometimes people like just don't get. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. I don't have a full understanding of this either. But this idea of like, it's called color zones of the face. The notion is, is that the top half of the face goes a bit more towards the yellow. The middle goes a bit more towards the red. And the bottom goes a bit more towards the cool, the desired reds, and maybe even a little bit of gray in there. And the zonal ideas of color. And I'm going to be completely honest with you that I don't particularly think in this way myself. But it can be worth considering because what's the origin of that idea? The origin of that idea is to say that, well, you have you know, a lot of flat area that's probably going to reflect the light source up there. You know, not that many blood vessels running through there. Over here in this area, a lot of blood vessels, a lot of subsurface capturing, the redness of the eyes, of the cheeks, the blush of the cheeks, you know, near the nose, near the full of the nose, uh, and near this, this whole cleft region over there. We have a lot of red in the lips, for example, and then the bottom usually has a little bit of reflected light or bounce light from the bottom. Uh, usually maybe for, for males, you have a bit of hair there, which desaturates. I think that may be close to why the origin of that idea, because it was told to me when I first started painting this idea. It was told to me by a very good painter. He said, you know, you should study the, the zones of the face. And honestly, that's one of the few pieces of advice that I never really put into, into practice. And I, I think I'm okay painting faces uh, for the most part. But I'm always curious because if somebody good recommends you something, it's worth thinking about, right? It's like in the gym when when somebody that's like looks like Kermit the Frog tells you how to do bicep curls, you say, I don't give a shit. You don't know what you're talking about. Look at you. But some giant like Ronnie Coleman, Arnold Schwarzenegger dude comes up to you and says, you know, you should maybe consider, you know, breaking parallel when you do a squat. Then I'm gonna I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know what? You know what, you're you're pretty yoked, right? You're pretty you're a pretty big dude. Maybe you know what you're talking about. So when a big artist when a great artist tells you something, I think it's worth thinking about. So I, I think about it all the time. I think about I think about like how can I apply that? You know? how, how do I uh, put that into into my painting? So when I figure that out, ask the grass. Hell yeah, Machiavelli, my man right there. That's my boy right there. Ask the grass all the time. If you aren't brushing against the felt of your gym floor, you ain't trying hard enough. Also, thanks for your mind. I appreciate the compliment, dude. Hopefully, uh, other people from my from our country think so as well, because I'm applying to new jobs um, with my current portfolio, and I'm not, I'm not super good, but um, we'll see what happens. I'm actually I talked about this in the stream earlier, uh, maybe yesterday's stream, but. I'm actually quite curious to see what the response is going to be. I hope they at least tell me what I'm doing wrong, you know? That'll, that itself will be very like, worth it for me. I love painting noses. So much you can do with them. Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. You want a lot to share portfolio? I, I've shared the majority of my stuff, but there's some pieces that I'm just keeping to my to just the portfolio. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll release them if, like, for example, if I get in, for example, I'll show you those pieces. But that's just because you know, there's some like things that I want to keep for future projects there. That's all. Like, there's there's no information lost. It's just like, oh, look at the pretty picture kind of thing. I'd be a little bit concerned about these edges. I don't want to go crazy over here. I don't want to go crazy. Might be too hot right there. A bit too hot. Okay, let's bring some of the novelty brushes in here. Okay, the novelty brushes suck. Let's go back to the usual brushes.
That's life right there. I'm putting money on them saying, James, we're sorry you're overqualified. Does anybody like say that and mean it though? Like the overqualified idea? Isn't it just because maybe you're just, just a bad fit? They don't want to hurt your feelings? You need to really be overqualified for a position. Like my, my ex's my brother was once denied a job because they said he was overqualified. But then later on he found out it's because the, the uh, employment manager didn't like him because he was too fat. Like something, it was like a really long story about it. I know that sounds stupid because it is. It is very stupid. Do we have a question mark at the end of that story? <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. I feel like I'm uh, being a little bit less impactful with my strokes in the last, let's say, five minutes. And I, I feel a certain way about that. So when that happens, what you do is this, all right? You take a big step back, all right? Take a deep breath. You accept how bad you are, all right? And then you continue. Now you make some really impactful strokes. Just remember, you know? Just gotta remember that we don't know it all. So big, big impactful changes over here. Get the temperature right on the, on the throat. Get some nice throaty reds on here, red nose, and um, start reassessing this little read that we have for the, for the neck over here. Also, a bunch of shapes are being missed, maybe a little bit of intricate value as well being missed over here. Should be able to manage this quite well. Just researching the, the shapes. I don't want things to be too non structured here. Mainly because if there's a big blank dark space underneath the throat, it's going to take away too much of the read from the main face. So I don't want it to be super, super like blank and vacant down here. So that's why I will put some time into kind of really trying to develop this area. That's probably why the artist did it as well, when I think of it. But this whole look overall, just trying to replicate it. Like we're not very close. Like we're we're in the ballpark, I would say. I would say maybe we're like uh, maybe seventy percent of the way there. But just even as as far as you've gotten, I gotta say I really like it. And the time frame is not that bad, you know. Like of course you're painting from a reference right now, so I I probably add like fifty percent more time if you're doing this from scratch. But even then, for like a two like a three hour painting. To arrive at a conclusion like this, for example, I'm okay with that actually. I think that's a, that's a decent conclusion because it's a very unique kind of look to the painting, especially for a digital piece of work. So I don't mind that, and I, I know I can up the efficiency uh, the more I do this. So it it might be worth exploring, I think. Again, always think about tiling it. Don't ever just use blending to save yourself from bad colors. Always think about what goes where. Be very strong and decisive with your decisions. She has a look that says she drinks coffee nine times a day. Here's another look. Did I ever tell you the story about the time that I, I talked about the, my coffee addiction to a store clerk that I, I was just talking to? I talked to her almost every day um, back in the Netherlands, and she thought I was talking about heroin. Like she thought I was speaking code to her, like it was a cry for help. It was a really fucking embarrassing conversation. I bought her a, a bunch of coffee, like really authentic coffee grains from India. And she said she threw them out, you know? She said she threw them out and I just think, I, okay, I'm not just ranting about my personal life. But whatever, fuck that girl. Really mean. <laughs> that coffee was kind of expensive and I like coffee. Whatever, you know, life, a trip. I didn't realize how strongly I felt about that before I said anything. It, yeah, she just smiled at me and she told me. Like she looked, it was like one of the weirdest social interactions I've ever had. She just told me that, I asked her, hey, how's the coffee I gave you? And she said, oh yeah, we just threw it away. And I'm like, what, what, what okay. Because <laughs> I'm very... Like I'm, I'm used, I, can, I can always talk, you know, like I never get flustered, 
but I genuinely didn't really know what to say at that point. It was such a strange, like, I just wasn't in the realm like, of the conversation. I still don't know why, you know? I just stopped talking after that. Anyway, that's my strange story for the day. Ben James, aka Indiana Broad, signing off. Why'd you give her expensive coffee? I don't know. We talked about coffee every day. I thought, you know what, it'd be funny to give her some good coffee. She sounds like a bitch. <laughs> Why drink coffee when you can have bone vita? Let me tell you, John, boost the secret of my energy, all right? Gotta get that boost. Imagine saturations in here. <laughs> she sounds like a bitch. Thanks, Nos. Appreciate you. Wait, she thought it was some kind of drug? Oh! I actually never thought about it that way. That might make some sense, you know? Interesting. Maybe that's what it was. Okay. Okay, maybe she wasn't a bitch. Alright, anyway. So that would, I would have lied when you asked. It's true, you know? How does she not lie to me? A very smooth, great, great copper. Okay, maybe not like that. Maybe a bit more convincing than that. Hey, you know what that sounds like, Nos? It sounds like one of those bots that comes into the stream and says, I'm really enjoying your Indiana Broad 94 channel. That kind of thing. Danny, how's it going, man? What is your program? <laughs> this is Krita. Free program. Uh, that's what it's called. It's free. Try it out. It's in the title if you didn't catch that. Also, I think I've been chastised by Inner Glow for putting the eyes in, so let's quickly put these pupils in and everything. Do the due diligence. It's been one hour and 30 minutes of painting, and I've just refused. I've fought against this man. So my last breath, and finally I will give in. He's incessant, he's inevitable. So finally I will succumb to the glow. Eventually we will all succumb to the glow. My goodness, what happened to the left? Alright, I use Coral Painter. I used to use Coral Painter. I like Painter a lot. A lot of artist friends that I have, a lot of professionals as well, they do prefer Painter for a lot of things. Oh, especially fuck. sketching. I can't believe you've done this. A chouch! Thanks, man. Appreciate the follow. What a great play, Indiana Brown 84. You have a great channel. <laughs> Alright, gotta get this value a bit higher. Whenever I want to get lighter, but lighter in the context of dark, I always pick the dark first because. If you say lighter, then you have a tendency to, you have a tendency of going over here, you know? Because that's lighter, generally speaking. But I just need something that's lighter than this dark value to cut in through the, uh, the darkness. So I pick the darkness first, and then I lighten that up, and then I make my test. I feel like this is a bit more of an efficient way of doing it. Especially since we have digital tools to help us out, right? Well, the painter's good, man. Painter's very good. But like this kind of look, like the, I'm assuming because you like the way the, the whole aesthetic is, right? It really comes from like how I'm using my brushes more than what the brushes actually are. Because I feel like I could probably re replicate this. Maybe, maybe that would be an interesting exercise to try and do this painting with a square brush or with a round brush. Because I think it's possible. I think it's very much possible. But it would be an interesting experiment to be sure. And it'd probably take me a bit more time, not to mention. Because the brushes are a convenience. But yeah, I do appreciate that follow. About that follow, I'm sorry. If you're wondering what we're doing, uh, we are painting a master study. An artist called John Viva. Really enjoy his work. In the community, pointed him out to me, and I've been infatuated with it. So, in that respect, 
I'm gonna be trying to figure out exactly what elements I want to kind of bring into my own work and trying to break down exactly what it looks like. I always knew you were a bot, Nos. I mean, who calls themselves Narcissus, am I right? Does Lareva use traditional or digital? He does Al Prima oil paint. Very much traditional. No, I'm gonna be mad, James. Why, you, why don't you just do tradition yourself if you like the look? The answer is because, because I'm lazy, man. I'm, I'm a bad person. You shouldn't be listening to me, that's why. But in truth, I work digitally. My process is, is digital. My understanding, my learning is done digitally. So, just trying to contrive it uh, into this. Also, it's expensive? Yeah, no shame, right? Like, I, I dabble with watercolors for a little bit, and even that would put a, just a sizable hole into my pocket. Can't imagine what uh, oils are like. Even Copics are supposed to be super expensive, like Copic refills. Back, got a claim of it. Oh, yeah, second thing is gonna be this over here. I'm gonna be painting her in this style. It'll be fun. So we added a little bit of an area of a light right there. We can just throw in a reflective. Throw in a bit of a reflective around the corner, like an accent color, right over there. Just to make it a bit more lively, you know? It's one of those key things that we kind of forget about traditional work, is the fact that things play with themselves way more than in digital. Digital has this ability to be strict, so a lot of people are indeed quite strict with a lot of their, um, a lot of their strokes, a lot of their work. But because of just how unruly and how you know, intrinsically random traditional media can be, sometimes you see a little bit more of a, a little bit of bleed through, and it gives it so much charm, you know? And I feel like to replicate that, you have to intentionally not try and make everything look clean. Let things get to know each other a little bit better. I want to make a big little change over here, really quickly. The change is this. I want to include a bit more of a form shadow over here. It's a little bit of an occlusion from the hair, as well as a form shadow of the eye. It's been split into one shadow shape right there. Hello, the, uh, there's my Asaro head right over there. So what's happening here is that um, she's... He's uh, taking the shadow over here, melding it with the shadow over here a little bit, and also the shadow cast by the hair. So it's all becoming one shape. Also, a bit more clarity would be nice in these areas over here. There's so much intricacy with the stroke. We're kind of putting it into practice, the way this curves around, being a little bit more dainty with the form shadows and the cast shadows, just developing certain areas a little bit better. And like I said, for the majority of this, for the last maybe half an hour, I haven't chosen really any new colors. It's just been... So for example, right now, I need to get a, a much more saturated version of the color. So now I'll choose a new color. But until this point, it's been very little choosing new colors. It's been all kind of restructured stuff. Because again, you want to get that simple idea in your painting, right? That seems a little bit too... Better. Also, the edge over here needs to be addressed. Nice soft edge near the side. You can address that edge. So I need to just find the color that I'm looking for over here. Again, so I'm looking into my own canvas. I'm saying, okay, maybe this pink over here on the top, similar to the pink down here, and therefore I use that same color right down there. Keep things nice and coordinated. That's really, really important. Look like this. Don't want to overcomplicate the canvas. There's a nice dark ochre color with the side of this. Again, I have to ask myself the question, do I have the ochre color anywhere else on my canvas? Right? And I should have it up here as well. And I think I have it right about here, I believe. But in there, maybe a touch darker than it is already. Add that color in. And I can also add it in up here. Oh, maybe it's a touch lighter than that. Maybe a bit more ochre. This kind of thought process, right? I get a color. Now I get something in my hand, where can I use it? Where, like, what are the places that I can use it for? So you can make a, a decision as an artist that way. You can say, okay, as an artist, I will use this here, here, and here. You can have a lot of logic behind it, which I recommend. Saying that, okay, this is the color that I've allocated for areas with a lot of blood underneath it that are in the area of light. This is the color that I'm going to use. And that's what this artist does. Very systematic. Because he does a lot of pre-mixing. He mixes his colors and then works. Doesn't mix the requirement.
That's worth considering, right? He came, in this, he came into this painting with a plan. Not that much like organic discovery happening here. It's just very clever usage of what he's uh, decided was going to be the best representation of this particular reference sketch. I think that's awesome. Getting some finalized values. So I'm doing this morph adjustment. So this brush that I'm using right now doesn't have nearly as much tooth on it. But it, lets, it kind of disguises itself in the middle of my other strokes and it lets me just slowly increase that value a little bit more because the value is a little bit more dead on my canvas overall. Maybe my underpainting was a bit too dark, but just to disguise the fact that some of these values are a little bit less impactful than they should be. Of course, I can always do the digital thing, right? I can always just update the value in general, do a slight lighting pass, get the values where they should be, but I don't know. If I'm going to do that, I'll leave it to the end of the painting. I don't want to do that right now. This dark stroke on the left-hand side, at least the top of it can be updated a bit more. But I like the hue already, so I'm going to update it just by increasing the hue right there. Maybe desaturating a bit more. I like that a lot. So this is a lot more strokey, right? That's a lot more... It kind of affects the edge a little bit more, but this one over here is going to go under the radar a bit more as well. I kind of like that brush for that reason. Because sometimes I want to just preserve an area, right? I want to preserve it a bit more, so in that respect, I'll maybe switch up the brushes a bit more uh, to preserve it. Do I like that change? Hmm. I don't know, actually. I like this change. In all of what I just did, I did like this, this part of it. That part made a lot of sense. It's, a, it's just fixing a bit of a form issue there. However, on the top, I do want to lighten that up. But not the way that I did it now. I don't want to see that much tooth. So in that case, if I just want to lighten it up and I don't want to see any tooth over there, I think what I'll do is I'll use a much more gradual kind of brush. This, for example. So I've got to be a little bit careful here because that pastel texture can cut into my painting a bit more. I'll use it a little bit and test it. Maybe not too good. The alternative approach to this is I can just lighten up canvas green. These are all methods of trying to, trying to get a change on my painting without having it look too uh, traditional. I'm sorry, traditional. But yeah. <clears throat> okay, I'm not satisfied, but my, so if I'm not satisfied and I'm wasting this much time on it, the last thing to do is just brute force it. And I feel like that works. By brute force, I mean, I acknowledge the fact that I like what was already there in terms of brushwork but uh, the values don't work, so I just repaint that stroke. Yeah, so not modification, just a repaint. But we have options, right? And you saw me just go through a checklist, and I feel like that helps a lot. Option number one, option number two, okay, then just repaint. So you're not wasting any time. There's any bit of work, you're right, absolutely correct. I need to uh, work on the lips a little bit more. That's a point that I don't bother, I wasn't paying attention. Uh, let's just finish up the eyes really quickly. Need an extra stroke right there. A highlight. So get a bit of a light on there. Maybe head a bit more towards the blue for the stroke. Just to get a bit more depth mentioned to the eye. On this side, it goes a bit to, towards the shadow. I think I have a shadow value right there. Cut the saturation a bit more. So traditionally, when you mix shadow color, blacks, fill the saturation a bit more. Go. The highlight for the eyes, uh, up to me how sharp I want that to be. I will paint it quite sharp, I think. So get the green, desaturate it again. Get that local color and then go from there. So don't just paint a, 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 as bright as you can value there because it can kill subtlety of the painting. A little bit right there. Right here. I'll lower the value of the highlight to the right hand side because it's more in shadow. Taking out a bit too much, don't you think? Because the contrast is too much. It's slightly. The contrast. Better now. What's the next portrait? It's going to be the one that 
It's only this one, because when I ask people to give portraits, I only got one, so... I think we'll submit it by nuts in the chat. I think in that one. And really painting it in this style, hopefully. It'll be a good, uh, a good little exercise. I have a couple of ideas of how I want to approach it. We'll see what I choose. Addressing the eye values a little bit here. There are a couple missing. Just to show the form of the eye, right? Shadow on one side, light on the other side. Just a little bit of the housekeeping here. Okay, let's next. Uh, we want to slightly up the saturation and the hardness of the local color, so we increase it, go a little bit lighter, test it. That seems okay. And we want to determine, or rather show, we want to show that top half, because the top lip does have a portion that is somewhat front-facing, and then it curls under. I want to show the front-facing portion with these strokes, because that's what we're doing with every individual stroke, by the way. So we're picking a value that represents a particular surface or a particular shape and how it's oriented towards the light source. So that's entirely what we're trying to do here. Let me get the dark value. This needs to be updated to be more darker and a bit more saturated. Have this value at the end of it. It seems appropriate. Use a value in the shape. I think the contrast might be a little bit heavier in the reference, but I'll, I'll contend with this for now. Because I have yet to put that light in on the bottom, and that light is most likely going to give me the contrast back. So I won't adjust it just yet. Just yet. I'll wait a little bit on it. Okay, uh, let's get that light quite nice and bright on the lip right there. And perhaps we can also adjust the light on the more of the mouth, the orbicularis aurus right there. Just a little bit of the uh, light right there. Okay, so we need to apply light on the lip right now. So we have some notion of what the color is approximately going to be from this value. Make the shape a bit better. It's going to have to go a little bit softer there. Hard and soft edges to it. Because it's a lip, a lot of form shadow to it, a lot of shape, very circular, very pouty, right? So I've got to be a little bit careful about the design here. Maybe overall a bit less saturated than I've actually painted it. I think it goes more towards the pink side, right? Goes more towards here, I would say. Otherwise, I'll make a slight adjustment, not too much though. I'll lighten it up because the lower lower lip is going to be in in the light. It's going to be facing the light because of the mat or rather because of the lipstick. The value is reduced a little bit, but then it's increased because of the light. So we end up with this kind of value over here, which has to be distinctly brighter than the lip. But again, we we should be able to justify these strokes because right? if we can't justify them. We won't, we're not going to be able to paint this in our own paintings because we need to understand why certain decisions have been made here. Update the shapes. That color I think I was happy enough with already. And also get this lovely exaggerated little stroke there. Or little tip of skin underneath the bottom lip that usually catches a bit of highlight. That value over here is a bit too dead, but thankfully I have a very similar value down here. Very similar color down there. So again, it's reuse. Like I said, it saves you so much time to reuse stuff. So reuse as much as you can. Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Here's the follow. Gotta be art. Thanks, dude. If you're an artist, post your work, by the way. I'd like to see it. Looking at other people's work. I thought actually the really cool thing about when people have art in their name. I don't have to ask them whether they're an artist. They usually are. Okay. So, uh, a couple of other things. So there's a little bit of revealed skin towards the bottom of the lip. Again, the same value is sufficient. It's not too far away. But we can use the same value. I might have to adjust the saturation, perhaps. Uh, maybe a little bit. I'll throw in a little bit of variation. That. The bad artists imitate, the great artists steal. Yeah, I saw it. That's a quote by Picasso, I think. There's a highlight. Look at that beautiful warm highlight on the left. My goodness. 
And I make the highlight, I really want to kind of follow the structure of the lip right there. Kind of bevels and curves. And also a little bit of edge work is probably appropriate there. Especially with the edges of it. I want to make that super clean. The artist has chosen to make it clean though. Okay, if the artist has chosen to make it clean, we make it clean. Which makes sense because he's been... We've seen throughout the course of our studies of this artist that he does really like to have those strong statements of highlight. I, I kind of dig the style, honestly. I kind of dig that, that choice by the artist. It's cool. Again, artist is John Lariva, by the way, if anybody not familiar. Lips coming in and fairly full force. I can maybe, now that I have the read, I think I will indeed update the shadow just a little bit more, get a bit more contrast on that. And simplify the shape, of course. I don't need to show too much information in the shadows. The way you interpret your shadows is going to be quite, it's going to have a really big impact on the way your work looks, but some of the artists, a lot of artists have this idea that if I'm going to reveal form in the lights, shadows themselves are going to not be as detailed. And that's, I think, a really fair, a really common across the board decision by a lot of realistic painters. They said, okay, well, this is going to be in the light, so I'm going to add a lot of information there. This is going to be in the shadow. I'm not going to add nearly as much information. I dig it. I paint it myself all the time. This is the more curving around. So the values I use over here are not going to be nearly as dark, or nearly as bright, I'm sorry, as the values up top. I have to be a little bit more careful. Also, I have to be careful with my brushes becoming too soft as well. I always want to retain that hardness, otherwise I lose out on the like a traditional look of, look of this painting. Got to be a little bit careful. Uh, let's strengthen up the shape a little bit more. The shape is quite harsh, but it, indeed this is quite a harsh shape on a lot of people. I remember uh, this particular shape, which is the other side of the orbicularis oris, so on the side of the maw of the face. It's very developed in certain people. Uh, Jen the Fit Creator, we've painted her, I think, four times total. She's a streamer on Twitch, go follow her if you haven't. Um, great artist herself, but she has a very developed lower maw. And it's gorgeous to paint, it's just so fun. One of the reasons why I like painting Jen. Gorgeous. Because you get to show so much structure, right? One of the most annoying things to me personally, and again, it's a personal thing, but I hate it when I can't see... I can't see, like, solid structure on the face when everything's really washed out. It's, uh, it's difficult for me to paint that because I paint very structurally, I think structurally, but when I don't see structure, I tend to panic a little bit. I had Picasso name on the plaque. Ah, uh, yeah, that's the joke right there. It's a Banksy piece. Thanks, Glow. I appreciate you. Not like you're describing a prized animal or a caught fish. <laughs> I'm just, just gotta, you know, just gotta appreciate things for what they are, you know. And it's good to know why. This jaw over here is—it's. It should be noted this, this part of the jaw over there. That's upward facing. Because the jaw protrudes, so this needs to be a lighter value. Okay. Again, justify the stroke. Please justify the stroke. If you can, please do it. Ever study structure or whatever? Please, please, for the love of God, paint. Try and understand, especially when painting from an artist who's that's doing everything oh, by intention. Fuck. I can't believe you've done this. And re realize like, why we're doing. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do here, right? I'm not. I'm not trying to like show or practice my copying skill here. Like, I'm really trying to figure out why decisions have been made. So that kind of that kind of stuff it really does help. And how he manages the edges is so, so beautiful, you know. It's so beautiful, like how he softens up this. Spot on the eye right there. Still with this over here. Not just that, but the tools I need to use to even achieve this look, just remembering them is a big deal for me because now if I ever want to kind of look or approach with this, this kind of look with my own work, do that. One new play, thanks dude. Appreciate the follow. We're doing a master study of John Lariva. This is usually time for about two hours. I'm just about done. Getting some additionals on here. Emboss hype. Are you excited for the emboss? 
I don't know if I'll, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it just for experimentation. Let's see what it looks like. Hey, Solid? Thanks, Polly. I'm just doing some minor edge management right now. Because on the last painting, I feel like I was a bit too lax on the edges. I don't think I did a good enough job um, trying to finish that painting. So this one, I'm being a bit more strict with myself. Sometimes, it's especially, I mean, I recognize the fact that I don't, I don't operate on optimum. I'm sorry, I don't operate on optimum efficiency all the time. Sometimes I just get tired, you know, while I work. But I always make it a point that whenever I do a painting, I go back and look at the painting I just did, and then see what I could have done better. And that's something I could have really done better from the last painting. Because there's just too much sloppiness, I think, in the edges. The last painting. I don't think that's very forgivable. Some of the edges, this is going to go into a cast shadow, but it is going to first go into a form shadow. I'm going to apply the form shadow value first. I'm going to pick a gray from the side of its face over here. Again, it's worth justifying, right? If something doesn't look right to you, kind of figure out why it is. So then you think about the structure of it, think about what's actually happening there. Okay, it's the side of the eye that's turning around into a shadow. It looks a bit too harsh, so what am I missing? It's in the half tone, right? It all does make sense, and it's so good that it does, because my goodness would painting be difficult if things didn't make sense, you know? If things were just fucking random, you know? And there, there's certain artists that work that way. They just do things because they feel like it's the right thing to do. And let me tell you, those are the worst artists that were to, to, to talk to. Like, they were one of my favorite artists. Like, for example, uh, Kate is one of the best intuitive painters I've ever seen. Like, her intuitive ability to, like, grasp color, it's unreal. Right, but I've I've bugged Kate so many times to try and like figure out how she chooses color, but I've never gotten got an answer. So either she's really hoarding that information, like really well, to the point where I don't think she is, or she's just a savant. But I love her colors. I always have. One of my best friends on the platform, by the way. The name again? This is her Twitch name. White color. That's a twitch. Bellatrix, but Bell for tricks with two X's. It's a buddy of mine. One of the first channels that I started hanging out on in uh, Creative. Very, very good. Do some mild management. I can include a little bit of a harsh statement in the transition of the chin kind of amp the read this guy really likes hardening up his chins which i kind of respect a lot it's a cool decision to do so dig how it looks and maybe don't add as much noise form shadow i'm sorry to this um with the light she's blonde sometimes no one to color color her hair Color my hair is not going to be around for too long. The male pattern born baldness thing is in my family quite heavily. I got mo I got all my hair right now, but probably not for much longer. Do I like that change? Um, I think this 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 whole bump here is a bit too exaggerated in my painting. So let's solve that first. All the bump. The beautiful thing is when the, when the painting starts coming coming together like this, you get to really start like going back and forth from different areas and drawing from the strong elements to fix the weak elements. Which is why I get like sample areas of my painting that are quite good, I think, at, at its current state, and I can use those colors and those harmonies to fix my weaker parts of the painting. So that's what we call the painting informing itself, and it's very powerful. It's one of those biggest reasons why you should never try and print out a painting, especially when you're painting your own work. Don't ever print something out, like go from the top and end at the bottom. That works for hyper-realistic stuff, I guess, but it does not work for a lot of painting. You've got to be a real genius. You've got to be a Kim Jong-un. Not, not Kim Jong-un, I'm sorry, that's the dictator. King, Kim Jong-gi um, to be able to do that. <laughs> it 
gonna be a real Kim Jong Un to do that. <laughs> Oh, we're past the time, motherfucker. Uh, can we leave it in the state? Is it pre presentable? I think it is. Pretty nice to watch. It's very, very impractical. Yeah, it is, it's not reproducible. The first time I've ever heard an artist rant about this on Twitch was give yourself a high five. He uh, had a really funny rant about it. Almost a year ago now. Whatever, James. Nice work. Thank you. Appreciate that. Just gonna solve a couple of value transition issues that I have on this painting. Just a couple of like minor things that have been bugging me because uh, I wasn't paying attention to the time there. But it's fine because I was explaining things throughout the painting. I'm sure I, I'm allowed a couple couple more minutes here. That there you go. Just open up an edge right over there. Is that a good change. Uh. No, no, it was not. I, I like the brush. I like the edge right there. It was good. It was good before. I'm gonna change the value there. It's a touch of softness. Nothing more. He's cheating. Um, okay, I think I'm done. He said as he continued to paint. <laughs> Let me just do the squiggly, the squiggly squiggies over here and uh, I'm done. He said. Um, a bit of that, you know? A bit of the razzle dazzle. Show, show them what your worth is, you know? Show your intelligence. Is that me, Azima? Just to finish off. Just the cropping a little bit. It's global, really? That's our painting right there. Uh, could use it with a bit of a left crop, right? A bit of a left crop right there. Oh boy, is everybody ready for inboss time? Grab your socks and put on your crocs. It's gonna be a wild bumpy ride. A little bit of spring cleaning there. Quality of life right there. FOV slider. I kind of dig the way it was. Like, I'm such a sucker for organic shit. Like, I love incidentalness in paintings. To a fault. Personal problem. Okay, there you go. I got some incidentalness back. You know what? It hurts too much. I'm leaving it in. There you go. Cool. That is a painting. Uh, two hours and five minutes. I'll take it. Also, I think I dropped 20% of my fucking frames this stream. What's happening? Okay. Um, we are done with the painting, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so what we're going to do right now is we are going to attempt to do a little bit of embossing to just give it a bit more of a traditional look towards the very end of the painting now that we've done all the work, we spent the time. Uh, it could easily oh, be worth the idea. I can't believe you've done this. That's a follow, by the way. I appreciate that. So what we could do is we could just try and amp the effect of the traditional look a little bit more by doing a bit of embossing. Okay? Let's try and do it. So first of all, before I mess up everything in this painting, I am going to save this because I haven't in a very long time. I'm going to export this so I have it. And we'll call this John Lavera Tree. This is our third study of this artist. All three done in two hours. Uh, and now we'll just put that in here. Just... Appreciate that, man. We're doing some master studies right now. I'm going to do a full portrait right after this. 
Let's just get this um, for comparison really quickly. And I'm so hungry for some pasta right now. <laughs> Did I mention that? <laughs> um, I don't even know if it's, uh, it's downstairs. Like maybe it was a fever dream. Never any pasta. Reva 3. It didn't export, by the way. That's why I double check every single time. Sometimes Krita debates me. That's what I'm using, by the way, if anybody's curious about the software. This Krita. It's a free software. A lot of people in the stream like to use it. Big proponent of it. Then again, any software will do you fine. These are the three Lariva studies. I'd say pretty, pretty okay, man. Pretty okay. I think we are somewhat, I think, getting a little bit better. A bit more comfortable in what we're doing. All right. So, embossing time. What we're going to do right now is we're going to duplicate this layer. And we are going to do some funky things to it. Okay. So, let's apply an emboss with variable depth. Filter we can do. We get this freaky looking thing. And we'll increase the depth a little bit. Oh, Jesus Christ. That's a, that's a lot of depth for damage. Okay. We hit OK. And we have this horrifying monstrosity. We have Han Solo stuck in carbonite. And now we hit soft light as a blending mode. And we slowly touch back a little bit. Give that final little oomph to it, right? So what this is doing is it's taking my strokes, adding a little bit of depth to it. What do you guys think? Yay or nay? So one of the unfortunate side effects of doing this is that it tends to harden up everything. So what I'm going to do while you guys decide is I'm going to selectively, I'm going to duplicate this and I'm going to selectively mask out certain areas of it to retain my softness. Because I want the softness back. I want it. Let's try and grab it for us. So where do I want my softness? In my, in my soft shadows, for example, underneath the eyes. I want that in the shadows over here. Wrong. The bottom shapes underneath the jawline right there. Some of the ideas in the hair can be nicely softened up. Hair doesn't need... Doesn't, maybe the strokes on the very top can be hardened up, but the rest of it, I don't think I like the idea of it having... It's a stark kind of identity. I think that doesn't make too much sense to me. Okay, we'll, we'll go one, two, three, and we'll see what's best, okay? Underneath the jaw? Come on, this can't be sharp. There's no way that can be that sharp. Nose right there. Shadows underneath the hair. We'll, we'll test this against the previous, and we'll see if it, if it helps. The subtle, smooth textures on the nose. We've got to keep that in there. Definitely got to keep that in there. I'm using an opacity-based eraser, by the way, to mask out. That in there. Okay. So. It's that versus. Hold on. Let me do it this way. Because it's hard for me to show you back and forth. So it's it's this versus this. I think it's an improvement. Maybe in the cheek as well. Looks better. I don't think you notice. It's a subtle thing, yeah. But the, the I think it's worth uh, considering that I'm seeing this at a, at a lot higher quality than you guys. So maybe on like the like Instagram or whatever, maybe this will become more important. Do some final little strokes here for personal uh, for personal. 
because uh, I don't want to be looking at this painting anymore once I'm done with it. Just to prevent like the blandness of that side of the head, I think. Like this is good. Because I don't have the, uh, the roses in the picture. I didn't paint those. To offset, so I want to make sure that I have something for completion's sake. Okay. Are the roses? I think they are, I'm assuming. But I would think they are. And just a little bit of a note towards these shadows underneath the nose, nostril, just a little bit, a couple of, a couple of values need to be added there. Thankfully I have everything I need to use, I have that from the top of the face. Just gotta just readjust that and put it in a couple of places. I have to maybe think of uh, some kind of brick or cobblestone. Could could also be the case, I think. Now that, now that you mentioned it, I think that, that also might actually be the, the truth. There's a bleed through value here that I kind of like a lot. That's why I'm kind of struggling to get it. I love that bleed through, it's so cool. I think I maybe have I maybe have I missed the bleed through value in this piece. And the bleed through that I did at the very beginning was maybe not what he used. Maybe if I'm gonna do one more mouse study of this guy, I'll do one that he has a video of. So I can kinda of, kinda of compare it once once and for all. I feel like I'm nitpicking right now. It always happens at the very end of my painting. Hmm. I don't. I definitely don't like that. Uh, I think it was probably the best at this stage. So one, one, two stroke maybe. Enough. Cool. Could you re-explain the process? Yeah, yeah, I can. Let me just export this really quickly. Just testing something, sorry. I think that's okay, right? Uh, it was a bit heavy for my taste just then, so I just had to double check it. I think this is fine. Like my like my digital like anal retentiveness comes in. Left upper cheek has a dot in it. Left upper cheek. Oh, cool. That I think I'll forego. Okay, I'll put it in for you, Glow. Right over there. We're talking about this one over here. Gola Beaver, thanks for the host, man. Remove? Where is it? Oh, this one over here? This thing? Oh, cool. Okay, I can remove that, yeah. Seems like a lot of work I just did to remove that one dot. Let's be a little bit more 
Maybe a little bit more forceful without removing. How about that? There you go, that's better. Done. <laughs> Don't worry about it, glove. All good. All right, that's our finished painting. Cool. Bit of tweaks in the end. I'll explain it in a second, Rami. Just one second. Let me just re-export this as final. Man, it just refuses to export. I think I managed to do it. Hope I managed to do it. Okay, I think that exported. Good. And yes, I have it. Okay, so the process is this, uh, Rami. What I did was, and I'll hopefully can show you the entire Krita screen. Show you all my windows. Uh, let's just go here. And we'll resize this. Okay, so what I did was this. I have my finished painting. And I just, so everything is on one layer, that's how, I, that's how I usually work. So I first, I duplicated the layer, like that. And then I went to filter, I went to emboss, and emboss with variable depth. So I get this emboss map, depth map. I up the value to something like 56, is what it shows, for the depth. And I hit OK. So I get the emboss map on top. So I need to now blend it with my regular painting. So it sits on top of it. But what I did was I changed up the layer blending mode to soft light right over there and i reduced the opacity to prevent it from cutting too hardly to, for the sharpness to not hit me so hard reduce the opacity down and then i selectively removed areas using the eraser uh, this eraser what i did Hope that makes some sense. Not that big of a difference, just a bit of icing on the cake, but when everything is zoomed in, it does tend to be a little bit more finished and tweaked. Again, like I said, the tools that I'm using are a little bit soft uh, to the tooth, so sometimes they can look a little bit uh, less than perfect upon closer inspection but the read is still there of course that's why we zoom out in the first place uh, some of the values could, be, could have had a bit more bite to them i think uh, but that's always seems to be the case with these studies i think i should consider having my base a little bit higher um, than it actually is at the very beginning so i'll choose my base tone a bit higher my, uh, my underpainting tone that is uh, but beyond that i think pretty successful missing on some of the hues uh, a bit of warmness being missed on the cheeks and the light isn't as strongly defined as I'd like. So uh, later on, I think I would definitely want to uh, up the contrast of the lights, I think. So we can even experiment to see how, what that looks like by just doing a bit of um, an adjustment here. We're just selectively kind of doing this in this particular manner. I can maybe improve the overall like look of the painting. Not not just like that, of course. Uh, it would be like this. Do an adjustment curve. I would make a filter mask out of it, and I'd filter out the uh, the non-lit areas just like this. Because the effect of the light just isn't that strong, and this is completely up to because of my poor choice of value. Like it's it's relatively correct, it's relatively correct, but it wasn't having didn't have the punch that I should have had when I chose them. So just a question of how my colors were mixed, uh, what I chose on the on the study. 
Uh, but I would definitely want to uh, be a little bit more careful about this in the future. Make a stronger statement. I don't have this problem when I'm generally either painting from imagination or using my own colors, but sometimes when I'm going off reference, I feel like I need to be better at this. Uh, I could be easily a lot better, better at this idea. But you see how that kind of brings so much of the flair back into the painting? Like, look, look at the difference. It's a lot, right? So, a few things that I could change. A bit of a self grip there. The eyes don't need to be this light, of course. The eyes down. But that, that, that I could have improved on. Been a bit better at that idea. But beyond that, I feel like it's been fairly successful. This thing. Okay, so uh, beyond this, we need to paint uh, our own stuff. Speaking of our own stuff, we're going to paint our own version of this kind of style in just a second. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go take a little bit of a break, go see if there's anything to eat downstairs because I am really starving. And when you get back, in about, let's say, 10 minutes or 5 minutes, something like that, we'll be painting this picture over here. Man, it's gonna be fun. But yeah, stay tuned for that. In the meantime, you guys wanna really post that in the Discord? Yeah, yeah, uh, the image, I will. I got the mission. Grab it really quickly. And in the references. by a friend or somebody in the community. So yeah, it'll be fun. We do this every now and again, right? So it's a good bit of fun. All right, guys, with that said, I am going to do, go take a break and be back as soon as I can, just anywhere, and then anything. But yeah, stick around.
Alright, and we are back. That was really loud, probably. How's it going, guys? Welcome back. Frogs, welcome to the chat, man. A dog's barking at something. Probably a, probably a robber or a mouse. Welcome, guys. So you had a bit of a break. There was indeed pasta downstairs, so I'm gonna be scarfing my fat face for just a little bit. But um, then we're gonna be jumping into the painting. But I think what would be, what would be really cool for us to do is let's watch this artist work just while I grab some food in my mouth. So I'll have that play and I'll have a little bit, little bit of commentary on top of it with my observations. But uh, let's just let's just go full React streamer for a second uh, because I really want to eat. I am very very carb deprived because I didn't uh, didn't keep to my intermittent fasting timings today and I really really need to reload carbs a little bit. Uh, let's quickly check for the channel. It'll be a good way of pimping the man, the man out himself as well. Let's get this going really quickly, since everybody over here is going to be Asmund Gold transformation. The Asmund Gold effect is this, you know, you play a video and then you pause it and you say, Wait a second, is that real? <laughs> Fucking Asmund Gold. <laughs> Alright, since all of, all of us are going to be painting this, um, I think it's worth, just if you guys have not watched the video, uh, watch this person work, I think it just might be very, very useful to just see how this process develops. Wait, we don't do that here? Hello, you're... Wait, wait, wait what? what are you talking about? Guitar. Also, how's it going, man? Pop in every now and again, but it's always good to make your acquaintance. Let's uh, quickly see if there's something in here. I am really... How about this one? Cool. Ten minutes. I shouldn't take more long. I shouldn't take longer than that. Let's get a display capture going. Broken emotes. Are you on mobile? Because that's the problem that I have all the time on mobile. Playing slow speed, maybe? <laughs> uh, we could do that, yeah. Uh, I mean, if it's something that we miss, we do it then. Let me just get a display capture going. I just switched to Streamlabs OBS, so things are a little bit broken right now. We should see if it's possible. 10 minute piece? It's, no, it's, it's gonna be just 10 minutes, I just wanna eat. Uh, I would just not be on stream at all, but uh, again, since this is, this is no cam, no nothing stream, I wanna give you guys something to look at. I we're just gonna fuck off somewhere. So let's quickly remove stuff here. Okay, I need to make a new scene really quickly. Just, just nice and easy, behind the scenes stuff. Hmm. For whatever reason, it refuses to allow me to display this particular window. That's weird. Must be a Streamlabs OBS thing then. That's very unfortunate because I really want to show you guys this. Anyway, uh, the video that I want you guys to watch, hopefully, uh, if you have time to do it, because I guess I actually have to go AFK then, is this one. Uh, just go ahead and check that out. That'll give you some good guidelines for the painting we're about to do. If you haven't already looked at the streamer. Uh, but I'm just going to be sitting here, I guess, eating. <laughs> and if you have any questions, I'll answer them. Uh, but not much going to be happening um, in terms of video because for some reason the capture doesn't work. That's very awkward. Let's get the music back on. And if you have any questions uh, on what you see, or again on the stuff that we just did because we just painted this. Uh, if anybody's curious, I've been doing John Lariva studies for uh, the last couple of days. We have three paintings at the end of it. So if you have any questions about it, uh, it's totally fine to ask right now. Let's get the music back then. Let's try to load by a track. On. There it is. You can do the weird ass Korean eating stream. Ah, oh, Jesus Christ, the mukbang. I hate that shit so much. A little later, cool cans. Yeah, mukbang is correct, and it is awful. So grating. But to be fair, I kind of understand to a certain extent why people like that kind of stuff. Because I like those, those like white head and pimple removing videos, as disgusting as they can be. Something oddly satisfying about that kind of stuff. 
So maybe I can relate to that, because some people find that disgusting. I mean, this this plate is stone cold. It is not hot at all, but it still tastes great. Yeah, let's see shrimp. Turn it over. Make sure it's too strong. Are you already cheating, Guitar? God damn it, this is my first carb in like almost 20 hours. Feels terrible. But yeah, if anybody has questions related to this kind of traditional look, this impasto look we've been doing, it's been uh, quite a quite a little bit of an adventure right ahead there. Write the link on the screen for when you post this on YouTube. It'll be helpful for someone following without their comments. Oh, uh, <laughs> I very much doubt. Uh, I'll make a note to put this in the description of the video, most likely. I'll, I'll pin a comment or something. But you're right, people do watch the vods. See my DMs? Let's see. That's not bad. Get in there, I think. Here's something that I want you to think about. Because you have extremely strong line work in your traditional in your traditional artwork, right? So with a painting like this, I'm somewhat confused why we would approach it strictly just painting, right? I'm assuming there are some lines involved here, but your line work is so good and you can really rely on your line work to save you these kind of paintings. Because no matter how iffy the whole paint situation is gonna be. It's still going to be looking quite fine, just as long as we maintain this, this notion of having the line work be quite, uh, quite strict and accurate. And you don't necessarily have that problem traditionally, so you shouldn't necessarily have the problem digitally either. So yeah, I think just tightening up those lines, and you're getting there with the shading as well. I would say keep it a bit more simple uh, with the edges and the shapes. If you want, you can just completely remove the idea of a lost edge and a soft edge, just paint everything hard or with an equal amount of hardness. But yeah, don't don't completely put yourself in an area of discomfort because you have very, very strong line work already. Don't be afraid of just relying on that to give you some comfort in this uncomfortable realm of digital art uh, now that you're making a transition. So yeah, don't be afraid of that. Some, some, some thoughts about that uh, painting. I know it's probably a WIP, but still, the way that you're approaching it right now. It calls it into question. The lag is killing you? Hmm. How bad is the lag? What about when you're painting? Is there also a lag when you're painting? Because maybe you need to up your, um, or reduce your canvas size, you know, just make sure everything is optimized. Because it shouldn't be that hard. It's almost like you're painting with a very, very long, like, brush pen. Which I think is totally possible. Heidi, how's it going? Good to see you. I hope you're having a good day. Follow Bog Ivory in the chat, or Bog Ivory. This may work. I'm glad you're enjoying the uh, Lariva studies. We've been having a good time with them. If you want to join us, Heidi, you're going to be painting this one really soon. In that. In this style. I'm probably going to edit it down um, because there's way too much negative space in this photograph. For just about this much. But it's going to be, um, it's going to be an, an interesting challenge. A lot to talk about. It's not that bad whenever you paint, huh? Maybe what you're using to sketch might be Maybe somehow graphically intensive, somehow? 
It, it shouldn't be an extreme amount of lag. I get it kind of like one is to one. Most of the time. Is it three hours? Um, it'll be as long as you like it to be, because this is for somebody uh, in the community. So if you want to just give them something nice, spend as much time as you want. Me personally, yeah, I just, I, I'm going to spend something like two hours at least on stream and then maybe some more off stream. That's my plan at least. Almost done, by the way. Oh, I realize my color wheel is broken. reminds me of Christian stuff. Christian stuff? What do you mean? I won't cheat, James. I'll just start 20 minutes before everybody else. <laughs> we already started. Well, I'm glad you guys are working on it. Hopefully I can catch up to you guys. Portraits are so hard. Yeah, I mean, they're about as hard as everything else, I would say. I mean, when it comes to drawing the human figure, human, the human face, anything that people are generally used to, it's always a bit difficult because people already have like a good basis of understanding and your, your expectation on yourself is great is greatly increased because your experience looking at faces is so much more than your experience looking at animals, for, for example. So, in that respect, it can be very daunting. But yeah, just like anything else, you got to believe in yourself, believe in your skill set. And with, with time, with work, it gets there. And your portraits are nothing to, to shy away from. I think you do a fantastic job already. So you're no slouch yourself. Probably my favorite of the, of the three. I really like the first one as well. The second one was kind of iffy, but I'll give myself a pass on that one. And plus I did learn a lot from the second. I argue I learned more from the second than the first. We've been live for four hours already. Jesus. Listen, shrimp. I'm shoving this. I'm sorry, not shrimp. Chimp. I'm shoving this in my mouth so I can start painting quicker for you guys. Have some goddamn consideration to your boy. Alright, I'm done. That was like. A solid pound and a half of pasta. I just shoved it, shoved it into my mouth. All right, I'm good. So if you guys do not have this reference, grab it from the Discord. It's in the study posts. I'm sorry, in the study references channel. Let's talk about just a little bit about the game plan that I'm going to be doing. And I feel like a few people in the chat have already begun. And I'll be curious about um, how theirs look at the end of it. I will be specifically trying to get it to at least based on what I've done on these studies, at least get it to look a little bit more traditional than my usual portraits. A bit more of this uh, kind of impasto texture to it, hopefully. And um, yeah, we'll see if we can manage it. And the water, and we'll start talking about it.
Okay, so for this particular painting, we have some additional considerations that need to be made over here because of the fact that we are now painting from life because life is a lot more complex than a painting. So there, there comes the problem, which is simplification. So we haven't talked about simplification too much because things have already been simplified for us in the paintings that we've been doing so far. But there are going to be some very, very strong shapes that need to be considered when we paint this particular painting. So the first one over here is going to be this one. That's a painting, that's a shape that describes the underside of the chin with respect to the neck. Another one, side of the nose, all the way up to the brow and the glabella right there. Another one over here, form shadow, depicting how high and how sharp that cheekbone is. And this shape over here can be ex extended all the way down here, by the way. You can go all the way down here and make something really, really kind of unique on the neck. The first thing that I'm going to do for this particular painting is I'm going to crop it inwards because I don't want to be painting everything over here. Maybe a bit closer to the face is where I want to be keeping most of the information, but it should be good. Is this person someone in Discord? It's somebody's friend on the Discord. How do you change your brush size so quickly? Do you use a button on your, t on your tablet or is it a hotkey? So in the program that I'm using, if I hold shift and, um, I'm sorry, shift and, I'm sorry, I think it's just shift, right? Yeah, it's just shift. Sorry, I don't think about the little hotkey. I had to check what I was doing. But um, if I just hold shift and drag my mouse, uh, or drag my pen rather, shift, press and drag, it allows me to increase the size. And I feel like a lot of uh, programs are like this. I know that it took me some time to figure this out in Creep Studio Paint. I don't know if in Photoshop you have this option, but you, pro you probably do. Photoshop is pretty pro powerful. So even if it's not like that uh, in default, it should be possible uh, if you modify stuff. But this is how it is in Creep. So you hold shift, click and drag. Some other useful shortcuts could be control, which is to simply sample stuff. I use shift and space to rotate the canvas. I, I press five, the number five, to reset the rotation. Uh, some things very specifically for me as an artist, I use a lot of selection tool in my painting. So I have the selection tool bounded to the mouse, I'm sorry, to my, um, to my pen button. So I can select really quickly. I can deselect with control shift A. So select, deselect, select, deselect. I can add to my selection by holding shift. I can remove from my selection using alt. I can paint in my selection by pressing Q and it, it brings my brush up. So whatever brush I have selected, I can I can just start uh, painting with that brush. Right? I can just start filling stuff up with that brush. I don't want a mask layer. There you go. And to be select, I can hit control shift A. Cheers shrimp. Rian, how's it going? Doing well. I think quite well, having a good time. We're, uh, we just finished another one of these paintings. We're about to go paint this particular reference in that style. Does the one third rule work in any angle, camera, and face? It does, as because it's uh, it'll it'll be skewed in perspective, of course, like any distance will be skewed in perspective. But if you account for the perspective skew, it'll still work. Like if you understand just how the distances are being skewed at the angle, it usually works. Also, should be considered that. You're not going to get crazy amounts of perspective skew on the face because everything is quite closely situated next to itself. So unless it's an extreme angle, most of the time you should be quite uh, quite good just simply dividing things very basically. So it should work just fine. Sorry, my dogs are going crazy. I think my dad's back. Uh, my dad was gone for a while. Let me get rid of this text, by the way. This doesn't need to be here. I might have to mute for a second while my dogs calm down because they're really excited for some reason. Well, not for some reason. My dad is like the favorite person in the world. All right, I'm just gonna do some organizational things first. Uh, I'll let the music play, but I'm gonna be my microphone. Thank you. 
Oh, fuck. I can't believe you've done this. Thanks to follow, man. Sorry, I'm, I'm used to just like, I'm just waiting for my dog to come down, so sorry if oh, I'm saying fuck. anything. I can't believe you've done this. Thanks for the follows, guys. I really appreciate it. I have a very heavy commentary in my stream, but uh, just, just for the viewer experience, I just don't want you to get, guys to get interrupted. I think they're quieted down, actually. Okay, we're good. So, I'm just resetting the canvas right now. We just finished three paintings. Just, well, as soon as this painting over here at the, at the very end. We just finished three... Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. There you go. That's what I'm trying, trying to avoid you listening to. But we just finished three studies of um, John Lariva. And these are all done digitally. He's an Ala Prima oil painter. And we're going to apply the things that we've learned uh, with this little painting over here. This little reference over here. So we're going to be trying to do this basically in that style. And hopefully we'll see just how much we took away from these three studies. Each of these were in two hours. So maybe I'll paint, I'll paint them maybe two and a half to three hours. Let's see how long it takes us. Okay, so I'm just doing some organizational things over here. Getting rid of my layers. Getting a default thing over here. And I have to do one last thing, which is... I have to simply... Oh, that's the wrong one. Good from earlier. I need to crop this reference. Because I don't want to paint everything full body. I want to keep this like a portrait. So I will indeed crop what I see. I don't mind the original picture. I think it's a great photograph. However, I do want to keep things a bit centered towards the face. Maybe show a little bit of the neck. So let's just grab a, a new document of this file. And we'll crop things a bit centered around the head. I'll still keep most of the painting still there. Are most of the references still there on the other reference that I have, but I'll be focusing on this, my primary. Sorry, that was a lot of barking. Oh, that might be my neighbor's dog. Uh, I'm gonna keep a cigarette in there, I think. I think that looks kinda cool. Uh, I think I like this kind of crawl thing. I think that kind of works out. Yeah, I'm happy with this. Let's export that really quickly. It should be good. Oh, that is my painting now. Oh, there it is. Cool. Should be just about ready to begin. Okay, so like I said, a bit of a discussion needs to be had about exactly the approach we're going to go towards this particular reference. So like I said before, we have to think about the simplification. There are going to be a couple of simplified shapes that is going to be paramount for us to get right. I believe uh, I'm going to first start with this large shape all the way up to the nose all over here. This is going to be a really, really large shape to get off the get-go. It's not a super complex shape. I could probably simplify in a few areas over there. But it's going to be quite important to get that shape in at the very beginning. Uh, as far as the colors go, because the colors is going to be an important aspect of this, what I'm going to do, since the lighting in this, in this reference is already quite warm, I will paint the extreme lights over there. I'll add a quite, a, quite a lot of bit of yellow, I think. A lot of saturated yellow, yellowish green, perhaps, to a certain extent. Almost similar to, uh, to this one over there. And I'll graduate towards the blush of the cheeks and the nose. I'll use kind of a richer, sort of pinker hue, I think. And for the lights on the, on the bottom, for the hues on the shadows, I'll hit that extremely with a lot of color contrast because this artist loves having good color contrast in their work. So I think it's, it's good as a homage to the original artist. Maybe we can add a little bit of color contrast by throwing in some blue hues um, for, the, for the chin, so, or for the, for the shadows. So the shadows over here are gonna be, let's say, something like a bluish uh, bluish purple and up here i'm gonna have it be a nice deep red uh, additionally i want to have a variation i think within the lights themselves that variation i'll probably have it again be a little bit closer to let's just say something like an ochre an ochre red something up here i think would uh, would make some amount of sense that's what i have planned for the colors and for the overall proportions since this is a person that needs to be recognized, I'm going to have to be a little bit more tighter than I was with my paintings. But I'm 
gonna leave a lot of room for interpretation, I think, in this painting. Because again, it needs to be about all else, uh, a technique uh, study than anything else. So hopefully we'll be able to manage it. All right, so I'm gonna allocate two hours for this painting right now. So we'll see where we're at in two hours. Reference, as always, is on the Discord. I think I'm finally understanding the blocking phase. Good, it's, uh, it's an important phase to kind of understand. Do you have anything to show if you'd like to uh, get something run by me? Now's a good time, since we're just about to start. Also, in the idea of simplification, please remember your simplified forms. So for the eyes, for the nose, for the mouth, all of them have these little key features when they respond to light that is really, really important to remember because that will prevent you from putting a billion different strokes. Because for example, when, I was, when I'm painting this particular part, there might be a bunch of you know, slight base tones over here, a base color, a slight amount of like, like initial underpainting, but the final value, the final light, the final stroke will be just there. Like this will be just one stroke basically. And it's the same thing in all, all of these paintings, right? For example, we have this, the stroke right there to determine that light side. And this over here, a little bit less light, heading away from the light. Same thing over here. That idea persists. Nice, strong, evocative shapes. Right? And the shapes are usually defined by very, very selective brushwork. That's the cornerstone of this whole idea. So we should be able to accomplish it. Enough. Check this card. Let me see. And once you check this, you can begin. Get in there, man. 100% get in there. Uh, I would say, so, I was a look at this on stream. We can do a couple of things over here. That's what Delhi Desire is working on right now. I think it's going really well. Uh, I want to think about a couple of things. One is that you have no problem correctly assessing the value. But I want you to be a little bit careful about how strong the value is. Because what's going to happen in this painting is when you get to the edge phase, this is thinking ahead a little bit, but you don't have to think ahead. Just think about this as something of a rule. You don't want to like extremely slam down on those shadows because the shape's being developed quite quite well. But I want you to pull back a little bit from that shadow, uh, just a little bit, because it's creating a much harsher, harsher edge than maybe you intend. Because as far as I, I can see in this painting, I feel like the shadow over here is quite it's quite similar to the shadow that I see over here on this side of the eye. Right? So it'll it's gonna be a valley kind of similar to this, maybe slightly darker than this, is what I would expect to see uh, right over there, I think. So if I was able to give that a slight little correction there, okay, well I can't do it that way, but maybe I can do it this way. Just quickly grab grab the shape really quickly. I would sort of slightly tone that up. I'm just making a bit of a making it a little bit easier myself, making it a lot turned up. But now I can actually paint and show you. But I would just kind of don't don't floor it any harsher than you need to you need to get the read. Because this kind of thing allows you to get a lot more subtlety into your work, and unless you have a bit more resolution in your shadow. So now I can actually clearly see my core shadow, for example, if that's something that's interesting to me. This kind of idea. Cool experiment. Sit later with this reference and see what his take his take is on it. <laughs> you think he'd listen? That'd be kind of cool if he did though. He seems like a cool dude, based on his like uh, painters and stuff like that. I've been watching a bunch of critiques. But be a little bit careful about that whole idea. Because if you're thinking correctly right now, you're thinking about, okay, strong shapes. Um, in terms of the strong shapes, uh, it, it's going quite well. Though, just be a little bit careful about uh, just how you simplify. Because sometimes the simplification can kind of lose you out on certain really important details. Uh, for instance, uh, we want to really kind of show, like what's a good example of this? So I want to show the curvature of the chin and the chin juts out in a particular angle, right? But it kind of starts right over here because of the formation of the, the shapes right underneath the lip. The lip shapes are like this, right? Lip structure. You have a couple of flanking muscular groups on both sides like that. And you have a center recess in the middle. So what happens generally speaking with light is that 
this recess will always be a little bit dark around here. And then depending on the position of the light, I'll have some light on this side. The light will be somewhat average over here. And since this plane over here is left facing, this plane usually gets a lot of darkness. So the shape that actually occurs here is going to be a lot further on this way. Like that. You expect, you expect to see something like this most of the time. I'll check the reference really quickly. Of course, there's a form shadow around the, uh, around the chin. But that's what, what we kind of see, right? We kind of see that same thing. That little hint of the triangle right there. The hit, little hint of the triangle right here. A recess underneath. And the, the beautiful curved form shadow right over there. Okay? So this is what's going to really help you with this kind of idea of getting good shapes. Like shapes that are not just good to look at, but shapes that really uh, help you sell your form is to kind of just understand structure. So we're just looking at this right now, right? So what I just told you comes from the Asara, basically. You weren't supposed to paint something else? Yeah, I'm just doing a quick right now. But that's what I wanted you to think about. So a couple of notes. Don't floor the value too much if you don't need to. And just be a little bit careful if your shape that you're developing is actually showing you the form. Because it could be very easy, and it's a very subtle thing uh, to, to miss. But the more you kind of pay attention to how that shape curves around your form, the stronger and more convincing of a read you're going to get in your, on, your, on your painting. And that's exactly what we're looking for with the shape. Okay? But good job so far. I like the way you're thinking right now. I think, I think your, uh, your mindset going into this uh, is improving significantly. So keep going. Alrighty, tidy. Seems like the animals outside have calmed down. It's like I can unmute my microphone completely now. Because I kept toggling it there. But it should be fine right now. Okay, guys. So, three hours on the clock. Let me just get into a comfortable position here. And we should be good to go. All right, three, two, one, and we go. It is that. The first thing that I want to do is I want to lay in this background really quickly. Right? I want to just add something to the background. I'm going to slightly adjust the overall cropping of this piece just because I want a bit more real estate to work with. And also the reference is a bit horizontal, so it'll help me kind of put things into proper positioning, hopefully. So we'll get something like this, maybe, for the overall portion of the canvas. And we've got, we're going to start filling it in with something that's a bit more lively. Like I say, I always like to have a bit of a lively canvas when I begin any painting. Have just a little bit of this. I'm not going to choose something close to the true value of the background just yet. Oh, oh, the true color rather of the background. The value is somewhat important, but even that I'm not going to floor it. I'm going to keep things a little bit washed out because I want the opportunity to be able to like make decisions later on with the painting. So maybe I want to change this color up or something. So I'm not going to go too heavy on the decision here. Just something to, for my painting to lay against, something for it to rest against. That's all I care about right now. Uh, I might want to just cut cut some of the tooth off of this, hopefully. It's going to reduce the toothage of this background because some of the, the uh, edges are a little bit too hard. We'll go back on it a little bit. And I'll throw in maybe a little bit of a hint of a gradient on one side. And that's all I'm going to do for the background, that's it. Okay, so for the character, I want to focus on separating this character out. Something to be considered over here is that the character itself is going to be lit by a warm light, but I kind of want to get something of a color contrast uh, with the warm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slightly cool down the background off the get-go because I feel like it's going to make for a better painting. I'm going to get a better read. So like I said, I'll choose the true color later on, but for now I'm just going to balance this more towards the cool. So what I'm going to do with this background is I'm going to quickly add just a little bit of, um, of blue to the balance. Hopefully that kind of helps me get a better read later on. So we'll add a bit of blue to the painting. Bit of blue to the background, cool it down a little bit. We're right over here. On this, we shall start. Okay, we'll begin. First thing I want to do is I want to separate out my main character, my focus, I'll separate it out from the background. I want to have some bleed through on the face, but I don't want to find the glabella. <laughs> I, I want some bleed through on the face, but I don't want this background value to bleed through, which is why I'm going to have this initial kind of random alien looking uh, selection at the very beginning. The purpose of this is simply I want something to separate my, my character from the background. That's all this is for. I want to separate the character from the background. So I'm just getting a little bit of uh, information on, on that silhouette here. A couple of strokes just to cover some area. Because all I'm doing is I'm kind of covering some area for me to work in. And once I have the selection, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to paint in some very large strokes of warm. 
I'll choose to be a little bit lighter with these strokes because in the, in the past I found that my bass coats are a little bit too dark. So I'll be a little bit lighter when I do this. And I'll test my melodies a couple of times. Let's say that's a bit too ochre for me. I want to be a bit more in the, in the reds. Maybe a bit too saturated. And this probably will be my final value. And I'm fine with that, that's okay. There's some artifacting happening at the top. Oh Jesus. <laughs> There's some slight little artifacting happening at the top because of the way the blending tool works. I'm sorry, the, uh, the brush works. The brush on Krita works off of something called a pixel engine. And the pixel engine relies on sampling the canvas, which is why it's so slow. It's, it's, it really, at least it's like really cool edges, but for some reason it's doesn't like uh, the transparency of the background. So I have the selection right now. Uh, I'm going to just grab a brush that's a bit easier to use on stream. Let's just grab something like uh, something like this, maybe. I want to block some things out really quickly. So I'm going to grab a darker, darker red. Some strong statements for the dress over there. Grab a nice ochre color for the uh, hair. I'll make a couple of statements up here. When I say statements, basically kind of marking some initial little landmark positions so I can begin painting. This can be a really daunting for painting in general because you don't really know where to start. There's so much empty space in the canvas. It can be a little bit difficult sometimes to begin with. So what I really encourage for this particular idea is that just, just go at it. Just go at it like a wild, like a wild animal. Just go at it and see how well you can do. Like I said I want this to be kind of a lovely blue color. Put the shadow down here near the neck. Or maybe it's going to be an orange. I don't know. I don't know entirely what I'm going to choose just yet. Usually I ask the people what their favorite color is and I build my palette off of that. Usually I'm used to these, uh, also this, this being very, very well coordinated. Um, so maybe instead of uh, blue, which is a bit too far away, since I'm going to have yellows in this piece, it's not too far away to imagine me having something like this, like a really kind of yellowish, ochreish green. Maybe that'll work for my, for my cools here. I think something like that will be fine. So I'm just adding in some, some initial little strokes over here, some small strokes, just to kind of test colors. So some people can test colors on a, on a palette or on spheres and things like that. When I like to test my colors, I do it right on the canvas. It's a bit uh, not the most beneficial thing, by the way, just to point out, just because of the fact that it takes up a lot of RAM, full-size canvas. Eventually we should come to something of a conclusion here. All right. I think I found a couple of colors that I like. Before I do anything else, I do really, really strongly want to figure out this whole notion of my of my structure, of my proportion, because this drawing is going to fail no matter what I do if I don't get the proportion right. So let's just jump into that really quickly. So I'll grab the usual brush that I use to kind of figure out my silhouettes. Let's draw the simple statement of the face. Keep it as simple as possible. It's going to benefit us. But what is the simple statement of the face? It's a nice, lovely angle square. Let's get the angle uh, right off the bat if we can. So that to me is about, um, what is on the clock? Like 10 minutes, I'd say, on the clock. So that's about right over there, I think. So you just use best guess. There. And since this jaw angle is closely tied to the angle of the eyes, I'm just going to establish that angle, the tilt of the face, just right now with these strokes. I'm not being too particular with my distancing. I will be in a second. But I want to have these strokes from the very get go of this piece. I want to have this start. To take shape because if i don't do this right now what's going to happen is that angle is going to get low balled it's going to get low balled in one way or the other and i really want to avoid that happening i don't want this angle to get missed because uh, if there's one thing that's going to ruin this painting it's going to be the fact that the tilt is not really set in and eventually it probably still won't be set in but it can stop me from trying to fight it right that right there so we, we're approaching the simple statement of the of the head right now just a simple little square Whenever I give a crit on just pure line work or pure proportions, this is usually what I ask people to do. Find a really, really simple statement in the in the head, and we're about to arrive, about to arrive on it. So I have the distance thing somewhat around where I want it to be. Be a little bit careful about exactly how dark my lines are. Get the, the, this angle over here of the hair. That's about at uh, about a four or a three. It's going to be right over there. And this is ultimately what we're left with. Okay. That's our simple face statement right there. We can proportion the neck based on this if you'd like to. Goes a little bit inward over here. I don't really care about like erasing my lines or anything because that's going to be taken care of when I address the background finally. But again, one thing at a time. Don't do any wasted strokes. Just try your best to avoid it. 
I see some lines of coordination over there, the neck goes across near the base of the neck all the way to the shoulder. I see this right there. And this is something the artist himself uses all the time. He uses these really long kind of statements in his painting. Just to simplify things a bit more. Because this area over here is not going to be an area that's going to be too, too important to try and uh, translate into the painting. So we just simplify it. Nice, simple, straight stroke right there. Are there any others that we can do like that? There's a line over here on the side of the neck. And we can indeed simplify it like that. Right? Kind of get where that where the angle goes. Some simple coordinations for the entire piece. The edge over here is going to give me a little bit of information towards the edge of the nose and the edge of the mouth. So that's going to be my final coordination line because there's a lot more to this painting that's going on. Are we seeing more of the bottom of the chin in the reference? Yes, we are in this reference, yes. Find the glabella. All right, find the glabella right now. We look at the little shapes over here. So obviously we need to kind of cut the shape up a little bit over here, but nice, simple, straight lines. So, so far, everything is nice and controllable, exactly what I'm looking for. So the eyebrows are a little bit inclined, so I'll add a bit of inclination to the eyebrows, still kind of following that basic initial guideline thing that I had over there with the angles. And I find the glabella really quickly. So the glabella I'm going to mark out with negatives, basically. The glabella is, if anybody's wondering, is the distance between the, uh, between the eyes. Area right over there. So the, the left one is a little bit more, more straight, so I can straighten it out. The right one has angles to it because we're drawing a three-fourth. And you immediately start to establish that really quickly. And the distance of the nose, uh, we can still do it via thirds, so we bring this one third down. I think where I have it right now is okay, but I'm going to have a slight note to myself in this painting, which is let me just one third, two third, three third thing. So one third, two third to find the bottom of the eye. Eyes are going to be somewhere around here, I mean the bottom of the eye. I need to make a very quick note for myself because of the extreme angle. It's not extreme, but it is an angle of this painting. I want to just quickly mark out the bottom side of the nose. To make sure that the nose happens as high as it needed to be because the actual distance between the eyes and the nose in this particular angle is really not, not that much like the bottom of the eye is just about the same height as the top of the ball of the nose so the top of the ball of the nose will be somewhere over here and the bottom of the eye is going to be right there as well be right there so a note needs to be made about that otherwise the uh, the perspective is going to fail a little bit and we don't want that to happen that's a uh, game over for this piece right easy enough then what's, what's going to happen is we're going to solve this whole issue with the chin. So bring the same distance down again, uh, but a little bit more because of the perspective. So this is about the normal distance, it's, I'd say, normal distance. And this is a little bit more right over there. So that's going to be the true bottom of the chin. I'll bring it a little bit upwards to get the curve around. And I measure the half to get the, uh, the lip, bottom of the lip, which is going to be right about there. Okay, I'm going to set in the little divot for the part, the part between the lips right over there. And I'm going to find the corners of the lips by cutting the eye shape in two. So it's corner right there and corner right here. Easy enough. So remember, I'm doing a block here. So this isn't meant to be pretty. This is just meant to be functional, right? That's all I care about, the functionality of it, because this is going to be a painting. And ultimately, it's up to you whether you want to have a really, really refined line art. But most of the time, I don't tend to need it. So I should be good. Of course, you know, I might end up eating those words, but you got to stick to your process. You got to have trust in your process always. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck till the end of time correcting a painting. Get a little bit of an indication to where is the curvature of the chin right there. Chin curves in that, that angle right over there. Think about the real estate that I have between the side of the face. And we have some real estate there. I will not make any conclusion on the outside silhouette just yet. I'm a little bit more concerned about inside stuff, inside shapes and their relationships right now. I'll make one strong little conclusion here, which is this angle over here on the eyes. I'm going to replicate the exact same angle down here near the cheek, and I'll draw in this little line right over there. And that's going to form the basis of my, my cheekbone shadow on the right hand side, right over there. Because remember, I'm looking for that simple statement. I need to find it as soon as possible. This little angle over here reminds me of the angle on the bottom of the nose. So again, have things nice and coordinated. I'm really trying to simplify this reference. All I care about. Simplify it heavily, that's all we can. So we're slowly arriving at some very, very good shapes here. In my opinion, some decent. So again, not a pretty way of starting, right? This is not a super attractive way of starting a painting. But again, all you gotta remember every one of these paintings we just did, all three of these started just like that. So it's worth trusting in the process because 
If we don't, then it's going to be wasted. We bleed too much time just trying to make things beautiful. But at the end of the day, the painting itself is weakened by it. So don't succumb to that urge. Fight it. Okay, the overall impression of the face. And what's your point? What's your, what? What are you talking about? You have to realize because of the delay, I said like 15 sentences before you said that, so I'm gonna need a whole contextualized sentence there. Okay, same thing with the angle of the overall shape of the nose right there. This nose over here is gonna have a very strong ball on that side. Nice coordinated muscle right there. Enough. So just marking out shapes myself. We're gonna start painting really soon, but this is basically what my block has always looked like. Nothing to be too afraid of at this point. I might consider lowering the eyes a little bit. I think the eyes are a little bit too high right now, so we'll lower that a bit more. But otherwise, I think I'm good to go for the painting. So 30 minutes, a bit more time to consider some, some stuff and also showing some stuff as well. Some time has been bled, but I think I should be good. Okay. So, uh, should I save this line work or save this block in? Maybe. I don't want to make a slight little change here, just uh, just a change for the overall look of the painting. I'm going to increase the size of that face because it saves me some time. You know, downsizing everything else, I can upsize this a bit more. There you go. Better. So now we fill this with paint. I'll start with the shadows and it will begin to kind of develop exactly what we were talking about earlier. So for the shadows over here, they're going to be nice and dark, of course, we're going to figure out that overall idea. These shadows are going to be quite a, kind of bland, as in they're not going to have too much uh, information in them. It's just going to matter about how I kind of position them, what the shape's going to be, and what their values are going to be, right? So I'm a little bit hesitant uh, to put a super saturated cool value here. I think because of the warmth of the face, I don't require all that much coolness. So we'll start right over here with this kind of color over here. I think that's fine. I'm going to start painting it all over. It's going to be the underside value right over there. I'm going to get desaturated as we move higher. I think I will indeed have a copy of this layer. I might want to test different color schemes. I'm going to have a deep red version of this color. So a deep red version as I go higher and higher. It's going to be around these areas right over there. This is going to be saturated. Maybe a nice and orange, you know, maybe an ochreish orange. Complement that. Initial strokes. The shadows are going to go cooler. So I'm going to bring in the face right there. There and try to coordinate as best as I can. So I'm gonna bring in a lot more reds in this area if I can. Bring a lot more reds for these shadows. And I head further and further away from the face. Over here, for instance, would be a great place to kind of put my accents, put my, put my blues maybe. And we'll keep it warm for the time being. I'll make a judgment, a judgment call about that in a second. So again, kind of finding the simple solutions, simple values. The shadow over here on the bottom side of the nose again it's going to be going into that red but i'm going to it's only red and maybe just to go on everything let's bring this shadow on the bottom maybe we'll bring this to a purple instead because then it'll make like a natural progression from orange all the way to purple as opposed to orange to purple to blue to green i think that's going to be a little bit strange so we'll keep it like this for the time being and we'll bring this into more of a we'll start with like a purplish purplish base we'll see what happens not welcome back. Yeah, we're we're giving a giving this painting a shot. Let's see what happens. Just at the underpainting stage right now. But we'll see. Hopefully uh, we get something decent at the end of it. Again, large, large blocks of color. Hair's gonna be nice and lovely warm. I can see hints of green in the hair, so maybe this is where I'm gonna put this green on my painting. Have those hints of uh sort of ochreish green up there. I think I'm okay with that. As it's wrong, welcome. Good to see it. And as it goes a little bit closer, we can bring in saturated reds right there. We'll see this.